range set is repper C, options repper C, I think. I think we're fine. Lock cell is definitely repper C. Hmm. I actually don't know if option is repper C. Okay. Static boot args is equal to boot args free memory <clears throat> lock cell new none. Okay, so that is memory. Okay, use boot args boot args. That'll get us access to that structure, private structure. Now it's not. Okay. No physical memory in roots. That's fine. Here. Bye bye. Okay. Now we have 22. Oh, no lock cell there. Yep, that's fine. PMM free, we're going to get rid of. And then we got pull in lock cell here. So use lock cell, lock cell. Lock cell is like a cheap mutex. Yeah, it's a, um, um, it's a, it's a type protected by uh, spin locks. PMM free. Yep. PMM free. So PMM free. We're actually going to do crate. We might want to pull in that. So we'll pull in use crate uh, boot args. And we'll make this pub. Okay. Um, 50 pmem free. So this will be uh, boot args.free memory.lock. Boot args.free memory.lock. Boot args.free memory. Uh oh. I don't like when we're getting more errors <laughs> as we fix code. Uh, MM 40 here. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's going to have to be PMM free dot lock. This will be PMM will be equal to boot args dot free memory dot lock. Wow. Wow, it's not going well. Uh, impl a, fizmem a. Lang item, that's fine. Page table and main 45. Fizmem not implemented for range set. Okay, so, yep, that is true. So we're gonna let, uh, let physical uh, let pmem is equal to physical memory. We'll make this pub. This pub. Uh, we're probably going to refactor some of this stuff, but I just want to get this building quick. pmem. And we'll say mm. So I'll wrap that up. Oh, here. So at this point, it's a mutable pointer. To arrange set. Page table new. Expected a mutable reference. Found that. So, yep, this will be a mutable reference to pmem. 
Fantastic. And now we've got this. That's on self 52, self dot zero dot allocate, where x in this case is pmem. Yeah, that doesn't have zero anymore. Ooh, we're getting close. Uh, physical memory, 160. Expected immutable reference to a range set. Found a range set. Um, PMEM in this case. We're just going to fill in with that. Nice. Uh, one of these, yep, this is no standard. Okay, cannot borrow as mutable 46 PMEM. Mute. God damn, I'm good. All right, let's reboot that, see if it works. Yep. Okay. Um, this. What are the downsides of in mem memory fuzzing? As I know, it's actually the fastest way to fuzz uh, things in user land. So, depends what you mean by in memory fuzzing. If you mean by like you just fuzz in a hot loop, the downsides are you can't fuzz things that have state. You can't fuzz things that like affect the state when you send your fuzz input through. If you use if you mean in-memory fuzzing in terms of like resetting to initial uh, previous process state via fork or something uh, like fork, uh, it's just better in every way. Can you use this to bypass easy anti-cheat? You can use anything to bypass easy anti-cheat. It's easy to bypass. That's what the easy stands for. Anti-cheats really only detect public tools. If you write your own tool, you can bypass pretty much anything. I mean mutation loop on uh, functions that are process input, for example, like using a memory uh, memory buffer instead of a file or something. I mean, it's just kind of better. In memory is just kind of the way to go. The only downside is it's more effort, potentially. Hard to set up. And it really is. It's pretty difficult to set up. All right. So that worked. No surprise. Um, uh, range set to allow implementing the bizmem trait. No period. Okay. I was just joking, uh, but I used to code uh, Lua poorly. I'm 16 right now. I, I guess I can focus on learning the hack games. Yeah, it's a fun way to learn. <clears throat> Hacking games is super fun. <clears throat> 
planning to use taint analysis to automate the interesting function detection. Hope it's supposed to work, as I expect. Taint tracking is really difficult. It can explode pretty quickly, and almost everything becomes tainted. So I think that's the biggest danger, is, is just not being able to see any of the signal because the noise is too high. The smaller your target, the better taint works, though. Um. All right. So now we want to pass, I think we want to pass a reference to this. And then we should be able to allocate on the kernel side of things. So that's what we'll do. We'll pass a boot args reference. Um, boot args. Oh, for this. Uh, oops. Boot args. It's going to be unhappy about that. Expect the U64. As... Uh, const boot args as u64. Okay, so we're going to pass a pointer to boot args, and now on the kernel side of things, let's close some of this shit. Yeah, so we'll uh, split the kernel source main, and then boot args, boot args. And that's a reference to the boot args structure. Fantastic. Not found in the scope. Yep, we'll use uh, use boot args boot args. Cool. Vim kernel cargo toml. Uh, this will replace serial with boot args. Cargo run. Beautiful. <clears throat> and now we have a reference to boot args. And it should boot. We haven't really changed anything. Okay. And now I should be able to do an allocation. Uh, if let boot, uh, if let sum pmem is equal to boot args dot free mem uh, as ref. Oh, we'll lock this. Yeah. Uh, let pmem is equal to boot args dot free mem dot lock. Uh, let pmem is equal to pmem dot as as mute unwrap print uh, pmem. Okay. Oh, we don't have print yet. Oh, uh, yeah, we do. We just gotta pull in serial. Love it. That serial actually might panic because serial has not been initialized. Ah, free memory. We'll knit the serial port here. Just to be careful. Oh. Mute that. Alright, let's see what we got. Oh, we're triple faulting. Uh oh. Let's see if we can figure out what issue. Yeah, maybe they're not the same shape. Possible. Reset. Okay. It's the print is failing. Oh, wait. We don't know that. We changed a lot of variables. Uh, we'll init the serial ports here. See if that kills us. Okay. Uh, that means we were able to get the locks. So let's see if we can print. 
Woot. Okay, so that's failing. Uh, serial print is not working. Okay. How do I globally suppress non-camel case? Yeah, allow non-camel case types. I wouldn't do it though. It's dangerous. Don't change the coding style. Hmm. Any suggestions on learning Rust? Yes, use the Rust book. Um. It's okay for people who want to ease into the language. Yeah. You'll just regret it if you build up current code bases with it. It's just, I don't know. I try to conform to the Rust style. I, I actually do. Uh, and it turns out tools and things and documentation just looks better. You just kind of get used to the style, and then the style actually adds kind of extra meaning to some of the some of the things. But yeah, I mean, go ahead, like do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> okay. So why is that failing? Is it an issue with pmem? No, it's an issue with print, right? Because. Let's not access the boot args, and we'll just print to the serial port. Um. Huh. I'm a little bit concerned that maybe I'm not initializing globals correctly. Because serial and networks, this works. But I can't print. What would that change? Print's going to start using some constants. And maybe that's the issue. Um, shared serial source. It's going to reinitialize everything. And then. Seal lock right. I'm just going to do a right here. Um, self dot right b test uh, CPU halt. Oh, I don't have that yet. Um, loop. We'll just do this then. We'll just write in a loop. And we'll see if this fails. If this if this works, then it's something much more complex. But I think it might have to do with... Oh, that did work. Um, shit. Okay, so that means something's going wrong in the print macro. So let's see. Let's comment out this. See if this succeeds. Wow, that's triple faulting. Really? Really? So doing a print is killing us. Get rid of, getting rid of the print, we're fine. Going back to having the print. That will use the serial writer. We'll do format args, and then it will call write string. And in this case, if we do nothing, oops, if we do nothing, this fails, which is strange. Um, 
that's not even hitting the bootloader. Because we're not seeing the bootloader messages. What? Oh, yeah, because we're killing the serial port on the... On the print. Yeah, no shit. Okay, so... Oh, and that's why that was working. Okay, so serial networks. And then... <clears throat> Is it my stack? Did I give it too small of a stack? Nah, 8K should be enough. 8K is plenty. R to the X, R to the X. I feel like something's not getting initialized correctly, which is strange. Triple faulting said getting a grand slam in baseball. <laughs> Fuck. Um, if boot args, fuck, why is print failing? Um... And then get it in your print, and it works again. I feel like something's not getting initialized. It feels very loader style issues. But that's hard to prove. We've really never printed something on the kernel side of things yet. We reinitialize the serial port. Fuck. What would have changed? We're able to init, and then we just, for some reason, we can't write. Um, so we're gonna say, um, config target uh, x86 PC oops, PC Windows MSVC. How do I do this shit? It's not that. Target is equal to this. I don't know if config target is the one. Is that actually working? What? Thinking QME, yeah, yeah, in a lot of cases you don't need to init the port. It's been initialized by the BIOS, but we re init it, it's fine. It costs pretty much nothing at runtime or compile time. Uh, Rust config target. Target OS. Yeah, what else? What options are there? Yeah, we'll do this one. Sixty four in quotes, quotes. So this should succeed in the bootloader, but fail in the kernel. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Self.write loop bsdf new line. Okay, so this is going to try and write. Huh. Interesting. And then if I do a panic here, that should infinite loop. 
Yep. So that's why are we not getting ASDF? We fill in the device. Self devices. I don't think we clobber. I don't think we clobber this memory. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be clobbering that. Um, we're able to get to this point. And let's see. Let's add this print back in. It shouldn't hit that print. It should get stuck in the infinite loop. And it does. But it's not writing anything. Um... Huh, I wonder if it's an inline as uh, an assembly issue. CPU. No, I don't think it is. I really don't think it is. Um. What's text console? Huh. Um, I feel like that should work. It's the same code. I feel like maybe our PE loading did not work. But that seems unlikely because we're able to print all of that stuff. Let's uh, let's go back to this. We'll grab the screen again, and then here we'll do uh, screen dot copy from slice. We'll just say b. This is just meant to stress the screen in a similar way. This is gonna look like garbage, uh, and that's fine. But I just want to see if this works. Oh, and I need to get rid of that serial stuff. But Hey, that's failing. Oh, I added the print back in. Fuck. Okay. Hey, it's still failing. Awesome. And then if I get rid of this, it will now be fine. Yeah, so it's something to do with data section accesses. Okay, perfect. That's what I expected, because the code is correct. All right, be right back.
Is Zerg ship faster than Standard Grand, for example? Well, Standard Grand is awful. Never use it. Ever. It's a terrible RNG. It's so biased. It's not even useful for fuzzing. Uh, what about Mersenne Twister? Xur Shift is much faster than Mersenne Twister. It's much, 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 much faster. All right. Um, build, kernel. All right. So we're going to do a couple things. This is going to be A. And this one does not work, right? Correct. This fails. This one succeeds. Okay. So I know that this one's okay. So this is B. Uh, vim a dot text b dot text. So the entry point did move, which is very interesting. That was one of the things I suspected. Um, print entry point is x p dot entry point I wonder if that's fucked cargo run oops cargo run this is the one that should die Entry point is that, reboot, and this one should be, I, you piece of shit. What? Oh, we have it commented out still, okay, good. Whew. So this one should hopefully fail. Perfect, and it has the updated entry point. But I'm a little bit, whoa. Whoa. What is this? Is that a graphical glitch? Oh, wow. No, I think bytes are being lost here on the output. Hmm. Why are we losing bytes? Why are we losing output like that? I don't know if that's like a real issue. Or like a printing issue. So. Hmm. This is a dot text. All right, so in a dot text, it expects to go to one one c zero, which is correct. And what has changed? This calls knit and loops.
so this would crash if we didn't have a stack, I think. 10.20. Oh, is this not using the stack? This does not touch the stack yet. So, we have actually not confirmed that our stack works. Yeah, that entire function doesn't use the stack. And then here, we're using the stack. I think that is the biggest indicator of what could be fucked. Hmm. Ah, uh, but we'd use the stack for the IRAT. Uh, assembly routines. Yeah, we use the stack here. Oh, oh, we switched to the new stack here. Um, move RBP minus eight zero. Uh, we need to say quad word. This is just going to see if we can write to the stack. And I bet we can't for some reason. So, well, that's a big difference between the two. Um, Carter run. So this is the one. This should succeed. We have that commented out. And then here we'll run this. Oh, that's nice. This will be an easy error. Fuck. I was hoping that was going to crash. How did that not crash? Okay, so the stacks map then. Um, unless I'm giving out dupes. Or I'm off on the calling convention. But I don't think I am. Let me write to RBP plus 20. Let's see if that works. The nerd red, what's up, man? Okay. And RBP plus 28, this should crash. This should triple fault in a loop. Okay, how did that succeed? Okay. Um. How the fuck is that not crashing? Dude, how is that not crashing? Um Okay, that that should crash. RBP. That might indicate that RBP is like near null then. Oh, we can't, we can't go too far. Um, what the fuck? What the fuck? I'm wondering if you had any tips for new game development programming uh, streamers. For new streamers? Oh, shit. I'm, I'm relatively new. I don't know what I'm doing, to be honest. Um... I would say, just be yourself and enjoy yourself. Have interesting programming content to do. Engage with your chat. Answer all the questions that you can get. That's what I tried to do, at least. Okay, what the fuck?
That's a non-canonical axis. That's always wrong. What? 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 Like that's, this is a very bad address. Um, occasional, occasionally go on 10 minute rants about the state of the world and software. I have the ability to talk for hours on end. Yeah. I just got a lot of shit to say. Mainly complaints. Um... What the fuck do I do here? So I need to figure out... So this... This... Can be possible. And this is possible if someone has an interrupt handler set up. Um... Oh, it's not rebuilding this! Uh oh. Am I stream ripperoni? Am I internet dead? No. Okay, we're good. Um, yeah, so this code's actually not being updated. Uh, cargo run, clean. Cargo run. Because uh, this file is not tracked as part of the build process. That's already gotten us like 50 fucking times. Okay. We have RBP plus 28. Cargo run, clean. Cargo run. We're going to need to track that that file so we rebuild it. Okay, 28. Yep, that's crashing. Great. What about 20? Oh, that should crash too. Perfect. Uh, so let's try move RBP. Let's just say racks. It doesn't matter what we're writing. This should crash. Perfect. And then if we do minus one or minus eight, this should not crash. And let's make sure we ran that last test. Oh, well, this is the new one. Okay. This one should be fine. Okay. Yeah. That means we were able to write to the stack sub RBP 28. And then we set that up as the new stack. Boot args, ref boot args. Let's do this. I'm concerned about that pointer. And let's put this back. I'm actually really concerned about that being our, uh, a reference, okay. Uh, const u64, let's just do a u64 for the boot args. Uh, clean. Build. Okay. So what could that be? So I guess one way we can check if it's stack calling convention things, we can subtract 128 extra here and make sure it's like already in the middle of like roughly valid stack. And that doesn't seem to fix it. Yeah, we're just kind of like YOLO checking stuff here. Fuck. Let's make sure this is back to the original state. It is. Boop. What the fuck? Got a bunch of these bytes here. You know, does this put us over to like a new size? Maybe we're not initializing that memory correctly. Yeah, this puts us over like 4K. So let's see what we're getting here. That's initializing the bytes. 
And we do that in split shared page table source. There we go. There we go. Sliced. Pages mute eight. Byte is equal to that. Uh, this is the virtual address minus the original virtual address plus the offset as a U64. I don't think this needs to be volatile. Those writes should still be occurring. We are throwing away the slice, but it does work in some cases. So let's print here, updating x to x offsets. And then the, this is going to be the val. Uh, val. So this is going to print the offset and then the byte that it's initializing it to. semi. Okay, here we go. I mean, these look pretty valid. Like these look pretty good. I don't know why we're losing those characters. I don't know if that's related. It's really hard to say if that's related. Let's make sure we're getting new pages. Uh, potentially we're returning the same pages or for some reason the pages are getting freed or something like that which would be pretty strange. Uh, we're gonna zero out that. Print. Uh, we wanna do this not in page table, but mm. Uh, and we need to use translate. I just noticed a bug in my page table stuff. Allocate. Uh, ret is equal to this, ret serial print allocated x ret and a question mark. Uh, okay, uh, dot map x x dot zero, that should allow us to print it. Okay. And we'll reboot. Oh, we still have that other spew. Where is it? Where's the spew? There, we'll just undo it. Okay. Yeah, these all look unique. They're all page aligned. And yeah, it looks like the allocations are good. Huh. What is possibly causing this? It feels like things are not getting initialized correctly. 
which is possible if my PE parser is broken. Um, entry point is that. I think we might not be mapping all the pages. This is going to... Yeah, but that's making a lot of the page allocations like I'd expect. Um... Page size, I think, is fine here. So let's go to... That's creating a page. That's initializing it, and then we map it. So let's go to map raw, and we'll do uh, print... Request to map x to x virtual address to raw. Okay. Now we're getting there. This will make it obvious. Maybe. Probably not. Uh, print serial. Oh, we don't have serial access here, do we? Fuck. Fuck, uh, shared page table, cargo toml. Uh, use serial. I'm just doing this so I remember to remove this when I'm done with using print. 182. virtual address and raw. Okay, so this will tell me what mappings are gonna be made in the page tables. Yep. Oh yeah, this is the linear mapping. Um, we don't need to map that much for our linear map, I don't think, for this stage. Yeah, we shouldn't need to. So we'll just set a... We'll just do a 1 meg identity map for now. This will just make the print spew a little bit less. Here we go. Perfect. Okay. So here's what we got. Yeah, there's some like weird serial corruption shit. Zero to three. All this stuff looks fantastic. And then this, we're mapping this to 10 C003. 11003. Cool, so that mapped two different pages. Uh, request to map zero, uh, this. Yeah, I don't know, I can't really read that output. I feel like I never have had these serial issues. I don't know if it's because I clicked this. So at one point I did that. Yeah, this doesn't have the corruption and here it does. Yep, okay, perfect. Can we actually copy pasta from here? We might as well use that then. Might as well. Is it reasonable to XOR the seed with the current timestamp each time I call the Zorship function? Otherwise, it seems like it'd be deterministic. Yeah, you want it to be deterministic for fuzzing. Uh, you don't want to XOR with the timestamp. That's gonna. That's actually gonna hurt the entropy quite a bit. 
And it's going to make it really slow. It's going to make it really slow. Um... Pause. Okay, perfect. This is nice. Um, request to map that. Okay. Good. Created that map. Then this. We created a map for 18 bytes. Then we created this map for CC bytes. Request to map. Um, this is making the stack. Yep. So that's creating the stack allocations. Um, and that makes sense. Yeah, that... That makes me think it's an initialization issue. really does because we are able to write to the stack the stack does work um what if i made like a significantly larger stack just just for shits And we'll go to, we'll go like right in the middle of this stack. Okay, still not working. Perfect, so I don't think it's stack related. Which leads it to basically only being able to be initialization. Or if somehow, uh, or if this shit's panicking. Is this panicking? Oh my God, am I blind? Is this panicking? Let's go, let's find a panic uh, quick. Here, let's get rid of this uh, copy and let's see if we can panic. That might be the issue. Okay, so that worked. Uh, and now let's do a panic. Bye. And let's see what we got here. Yep, okay. Uh, we might just be getting a panic. I don't know why. Kernel source panic. So if we get rid of all this, uh, this should no longer crash. Unpause. That's good, but now we're at this address. So we're panicking, and I don't know what's causing the panic. Uh, there we have a different entry point, and we didn't crash. I don't think we're panicking in serial init. Uh, oh, is that, uh, is that covering the screen in crap? Yeah, it is. Good. Um, actually, I kind of expect the screen. Okay, something's going on here then. That copy from Slice is failing, but I should be able to do a screen zero is OXOF 30. Uh, actually, 30 OF. And this will succeed. There's the zero. Okay, so now we have a we have an indicator of where we are. So there we have a zero. Okay, cool. Here we're going to put a, a one, same location. So if we see a one, we know that we didn't panic. Okay, we have a zero. That means we panicked and copied from Slice. And... 
Um, that's really interesting because I don't know what would cause that panic to occur. Oh, that doesn't match the size. Um, we got to do this. This should now... There we go. Yep, that puts shit on the screen. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16... There we go. So this will cover up the first thing with a one, and it's going to put, like, yeah, A's. There we go. I don't know why I keep going. That's apparently my new sound effect today. Okay, so now we can do cereal, print, apples. Let's see if that's working. Wow, that's failing hard. Okay, so something's failing in cereal print, then... And I, I have no idea what would be doing that. Now we significantly increased the size of our binary, which is potentially concerning because now we're on a new page. Um, let's see. It's not the new line issue. Right byte. I had. All right, I will not call serial init. See if that. Yeah, it's not that we're reinitializing it and fucking up the state. What is... How would these ever fail? I feel like something's not getting mapped. I really do. If right, page right, page present. If exec zero, else nx. So this will set, yeah, this will set everything RWX. I mean, we see we see the allocations that we're using. How would that be any different? And the i3, no, this is a DWM. This is it a custom kernel? Yeah, it is. Map that into the page table. We have no way of freeing the memory, so we're definitely not freeing it. Uh, actually, maybe I am. Maybe I am. No, PE shouldn't be freed at this stage. Nothing should be freed at that stage. Um. What on earth? Unless my IOPL is fucked and somehow I'm running in user mode? No. That would be a pretty catastrophic bug. Create the entry. All the table entries are this. Or these are not getting written in.
I, if somehow that's not getting written because it's not a volatile write and the compiler is getting smart and dropping it. I don't know. We'll, conver we'll convert all these to volatiles. Volatile vad as mute to 64 vad. Oh, we were going to try the uh, kill the freeze just in case. Oops. Dialic. Okay. Bye bye. We have no way of freeing anymore. Still issues. Okay, so it's not that. And it shouldn't have been. Um, I don't know. It seems to be an issue once it exceeds the 4K. And I think that's what's really confusing to me. Is It, it seems like once the kernel gets large enough, it stops working. Mm, these are all single page maps. Unfortunately, it's really hard to cause this to not get optimized out. Um, we'll say if screen 20 is equal to OXFF, it will not be. Um, if it's not equal to that, which it won't, uh, yeah, this should hit, uh, CPU halt. Let's see if this succeeds. This should keep the other stuff in there because the compiler's not going to be able to optimize that out. Okay. There we hit the halt, but we have the same image size. And that means that we're actually hitting that just fine. Okay, perfect. So let's uh, let's manually write to the serial port. Oh, we have to initialize that serial port right now. Print. Wait. If we don't initialize the serial port, That structure should be zeroed out, and, and none of this stuff should be... It should just be none. All of this should be none. I'm going to make this pub temporarily. Oh, I can't print this. Um... All the devices will be none. And if they're none, we just won't print to them. We have recursion here. But our stack is fine, I think. I think our stack is fine. Let's uh, let's write some stuff to our stack. Dude, this is really confusing. Uh, let buff is equal to o u eight ten twenty four buff copy from slice. Uh, buff, iter, ah, we'll just do x41. And here we'll do a, yeah, we'll do this. Buff, okay. Mm, yep, we gotta slice that up. Okay, and that seems to be fine. So what would be unique about print? In this case, print 
should just not be doing anything. Unless this global is fucked and not getting initialized to zero. If I do, if I just do zero, if I initialize all the memory to zero, this should just never even get into the kernel. Perfect. And there we're initializing it, and we are fine. Okay. Unwrap or zero. Initializing v size. Okay, let's take a look at uh, let's get uh, let's get a version that's crashing. Let's go back to this. Make sure that we crash. Okay, so this one should crash. Uh, and then we're going to see what these things are initialized to. Yeah, so that's good. That's crashing. So now I can obj dump d kernel uh, build kernel release kernel.exe. Power streaming, man. I'm doing okay. I would like for this bug to be done because this is really annoying. I have no idea what it is. So we execute the entry. There we write to B800. Here we get a stack local. We're setting up the stack. Um, sub significant off the stack, so we should be good. Um, Then we call core format write. Okay. So I think we're fine to that point for sure. Um, okay. Is it format issues? This is going to touch a, a bunch of globals, potentially. Oh. Uh, let's, uh, let's get this LTO'd. LTO is fat. That should um, should make the assembly a little bit more readable. Hopefully. Wow, that's still calling core format right. I'm actually pretty surprised by that. Um, unless we have logs here, I'm going to see if I have logs. Uh, I'd really like to see if there's a way that I can determine how the, how it crashed. And I probably have... Probably have like a KVM log or something like that, or QMU log. Libvert QMU. Oh, it looks like I do have logs, potentially. Usdev.log. Hmm. device redirected. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not telling me the triple fault reason. Uh, 
Um, dude, that's just so weird. So weird. It seems to be an issue once we hit format. Panic on bounce check, but that shouldn't be a thing. Just calling that. I'm really surprised that that print's not getting optimized through. Um. Let's uh let's get this public. And see if we can go directly to it. I just I just need to be able to print. Otherwise I'm debugging pretty blind right now. Serial serial write B ASDF. Ah, uh, private type. Yep. Uh, serial dot lock. Ah, uh, fn writes. Pub fn write. Okay, so now we're writing directly to the serial port, and we're fine. Yeah, that didn't do anything. Okay. Okay, and that's fine because we don't init the serial, so this will then cause it, this should now print ASDF. Uh, we got a semicolon, ooh, I like that. I actually really like that. What language do I need to learn for game cheating? You can use pretty much any language. Like, actually, <laughs> you'll probably want to learn C, but uh, just so you can understand what you're, like, actually cheating against. But, fuck, what is this, man? Seeing the semicolon actually makes me really happy. Kind of. That makes me believe that uh, constants aren't being set up correctly. We're just seeing that single semicolon. Weird. Weird. Let me do it a couple times, see if I get different results. Yep, that's different. Um, yeah, I think bytes just aren't getting initialized correctly. Loop. We'll just loop forever. We'll see what we'll see what we get here. Awesome. We can uh, we can probably figure this one out now. This assembly should be much more straightforward. Uh, that's initializing the ports. Then we get down to, where's the loop? Um, jump here. This is the loop. This is the start of the loop. That makes sense, there's the alignment for the loop. Uh, at RCX1, Really? Uh, let's turn off LTO now. And we'll see how this behaves. This should behave slightly differently, potentially. So, yep, it did, perfect. Yeah, I think that, I think that shows that we're uh, not loading the PE correctly, which is great. Um, we're getting close to the issue.
Um, this is serial init entry. Okay, here we're going to get access to the serial port. And then here we're going to move RDI plus four to get the length. Oh no, that's checking, uh, that's still doing the lock, Never mind. So this is doing the lock, there's the pause, here's after the lock is released. We jump to this. Whoa. Serial right. 2000. What is 2000? 21 is the length of the st string. 33 bytes. I have no idea what the 2000 is. That would indicate that that's the pointer. RCX is the this. This is the pointer. This is the pointer to the to the fucking thing. That's the first thing in the data section. Dude, what the fuck? Like it's it's not our exe loading that's failing. It's that's literally just wrong. Um, that's I mean it's probably hoping that will get fixed up in relocations, but we mark it as static. Um Wow. Let's put the base here. See what we get here. Here's the pointer. One three three seven two thousand. Um, yeah, that's a problem right there. Wow. What if I get rid of fixed? It's fixed. I bet it's fixed, man. Whoa. Dude, I mean, that's like zero extending that too. Like what? Let's get rid of all of these things and the dwarf stuff. Entry native, no default lib. Oh my God. I discovered your channel, cool stuff. Glad you're enjoying it. We gotta figure out what this bug is. Look at that, it's not our fault. I told you it wasn't our fault. Fucking knew it. Uh, LED link. Help. 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 Disable base relocations force. Is it just because I am, what if I don't specify a base? Uh, that picked a default base. Oh, that's still broken. Wow. What is this doing? What is this doing? 
sushi roll. Okay. Colonel Cargo Config. Relocation model static. That's it. That broke it. There we go. There's its, uh, its rip rel. Okay, cool. Um. Wow, 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 wow. Fuck. Those are good. All right, now we got to undo basically everything we just did because it was So, we did have it right the first try. That was a That was really rough, guys. That's the those are OS dev problems right there. Yeah. Oh my gosh, guys. That was that was something. That really was. Here we go. There we go. Created a map at those. All right, let's, uh, good hour and a half or so. Yeah, man. Let's, I'm going to get rid of it for this one then. How much did that change our bootloader size? Not enough to keep it around. Um... <laughs> Shakespeare's that cloud, yeah, man, that was that was rough, but that's that's a great example of uh, the sort of stuff you see when you're doing um, kernel work. Where did that base that at? Oh, that base! Oh, look at that! Look at that! That had a different base because we don't care about where it's based at. Fuck yeah! So, um, wow. Wow, guys. Base. File align this, align 4096. We won't pass fixed. You know, what if I don't pass fixed here? I'm just curious. Uh, we'll go over and build it somewhere else. Oh, yeah, this. Car run clean. Car run. Seventeen five eighty. 
And with fixed, 16978. So I'm pretty sure this will emit like a got. And let me see if I can do fixed on the kernel. I bet I can do fixed on the kernel. I think it's just that relocation model that I can't use. So 16, okay, and then obj dump d uh, build kernel x release then dash, oops, oops. Uh, rip. Yeah, so this is still doing rip rel. So that's doing rip relative, which I think is just its, uh, what it's going to be biased to do. And then i586, oops, bootloader i586 release bootloader.exe vim dash. And then this is still going to use static, I think. Because there's no way, uh, the way this would work is it would do a, like a ret inside of a function to get the return address. And I don't think it's going to do that. So let's do, um, so I wonder if this has relocations actually. Ob dump. Uh, and let's look at LLD link help and fixed. Disable base relocations. Um, and then the relocation model was from Rust C. Relocation model help. So we did static. What is dynamic note pick? So pick, yeah, we're still gonna have relocations on all of them, but anyways. Let's take a look. This is what we currently have. We didn't edit these. LD link, subsystem native, different bases, file align, thousand hex fixed, 4K line up here, debug dwarf, no default lib, and then that has the extra thing. Per run clean. Okay, this is everything fresh. And here we go. Boo! And there we go. We're based at leap. Okay, and that works, and wow, and that's using print. Okay, so now we can go back to what we were doing. Wow. Boot args, and this can be a boot args reference. And there we go. This is all of the free memory, and it looks like three in use. Yeah, and there we go. And we're sharing that lock. So, oh my god. That was a, that was a doozy, y'all. That, that was a doozy. Open file, close file. I don't think I need that. Requested file is that. Open, downloaded, closed. I don't think I need those messages. Those are kind of gross. Uh, that's in open uh, source bootloader source pixie. Uh, let's just look at all these downloaded. Okay. Boop. TFTP server IP requested file. This is this. Created map for these. Entry point is at this. We jump into the entry point. Obviously, everything's working now.
<laughs> we did it though, yeah. So, um, I think if we do relocation model static, it gets very confused because it uses 32-bit addresses. We can probably do that on the bootloader, and it saves a little bit because it probably has some support for dynamic base stuff, but whatever. We print debugging memory mapping? Uh, yeah, we just debug printed that, yeah. We're not actually debugging it. Uh, it works. So that's all fine. So let's see. And we should be able to panic as well. Um, uh, panic waffles. And we should be able to get a panic here. There it is. Yep, panic source main 22.9. And here we go, 22.9. is exactly where we are. I don't know why I keep making that noise. The fuck is wrong with me? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so that is great. So at this point, we can now make a, a, a physical memory allocator um, I actually kind of want to get rid of that identity map. Well, we can make this four gigs again. Because it doesn't really matter. And this will work. Yep. Uh, what do I want to do here? I'm gonna get allocations working in the kernel. The kernel, we need to have a physical memory allocator and we have one. Uh, and the physmem stuff, we're gonna need to implement this as well. Oh yeah, there's a bug I noticed. Um, in the init, where I assumed init and page table, uh, shared page table. source lib this init right here oh this zeroed so this one's fine because we translate it right here we make sure that we can translate that in init we're not doing that in this case since we're identity mapped it's fine but here we're going to um, this will be bytes. So uh, translate the page. And in this case, this will just be for 4096. And this will be for uh, page.0. Uh, actually, page. So we made, a f we made a physical page. And then we're going to request, hey, I would like a virtual mapping of that. Um, oh, page size. So we're going to say, I would like a window where I can access page for page size bytes. We get bytes. We then turn that into a slice for page size. So that matches. And then at this point, we then uh, go through all of the bytes and we call the init to initialize those. Uh, this is not self. This is uh, fizz mem. And expected a U size. Perfect. This should work identically. It's just more correct to my uh, conventions. Okay. So now that means in the kernel we can make uh, memory manager source mm.rs. And here we'll do mod mm. So we're going to need to make one of these. Uh, one of these bad boys. Uh, since we're identity mapped, we can do the exact same thing here again. And we're gonna make a global allocator, very similar. Oops, we want all of this. Okay, 
layout. Use core alloc layout. Boot arg is not a global. Eric alloc, alloc handler. Yep. Alec handler. Okay. Fizz adder. Uh, this is from core alloc. Global alloc. Uh, use a page table. Fizz mem. Fizz adder. Vert adder. Okay, no page table. Kernel. Cargo.toml. Uh, get status. We actually changed. Ooh, our, our, um, dot zero dash. Okay. Get status. So we changed. Let's see if this toml is in good shape. That is. Okay, and then I thought we changed one of the tomls to have access to serial port. Oh, that was in uh, page table, I think. Shared uh, boot args. That has lock cell and range set. That's true. That's all it needs. And then page table. Cargo toml. Yeah, that does not need serial, but it does need a CPU. Okay. Cannot find range set in this scope. Yep. Uh, use range set, range set, and we'll run range as well. Yeah. I'll put a space there. New line. Uh, ooh. Kernel. Do I need range set? Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, vim kernel cargo dot toml range sets. Run. Try into use core convert. Try into. Okay, boot args. Yep. Uh, Yeah, so um, we can actually do this. So boot args is a static, which is const, which means that in main, we can actually say that this is a const. Or static, sorry. And since that's static, uh, we can do const or static, boot args is um, I technically don't need to lock access to it, but I need to I need to put it in a global. But I don't have a good way of doing that. I have to use unsafe. And I really don't want to. Really don't want to. Do you need to put it in the global? Um, yeah, because I'm going to need it... Uh, for allocations. Um, so I don't have a good way of doing that. Uh, 
Uh, I could have an mm init function. So I could have a, a pub fn mm init, and then this could have access to it. So we'll do pub fn mm. Uh, we'll just do init here, and this will take a boot args static boot args, and then this will actually use an unsafe global here, and then we won't have to pub the global. So um, static mute mutable statics are not safe. Uh, boot args static boot args. which is uh, we can actually option this um Honestly, I'm actually okay using a lock on here. We're only going to hit this when we allocate new physical memory. We can pass this. That can set it up in some global, which we can protect with a lock. But the, the problem is there's no reason we do that. Um... I could put as an arg for global allocator. when I make this global allocator. And we have to fix up some of these comments too. We'll get to that once we figure out how we want to architect. A lot of this code we're gonna delete. I really only care about the, um, like these two. A wrapper on a range set to allow for implementing the FizzMem trait. Mm. Uh, static mute. I think we have to do static mute. Otherwise, we're going to have to put it in a lock cell. And that just makes no sense. Boot args. Boot args. Now, the question is, how do we actually set up this... Uh, use boot args, boot args. How do we initialize this? That's the... I don't know if I can make a null pointer. Uh, core pointer null mute. Let's see if I can do this. Hmm. Hey, Pink Fluffy, how's it going? Uh, okay, so basically we have this boot arguments that's passed by the bootloader, and we get it as an argument. We need to put it in a global such that, such that we have some way to access it through functions which will no longer have access to that argument, because we're going we're gonna to lose access to that argument pretty quickly. 
Um, and without an allocator, I can't make thread locals. Yet. Oh, I can make thread locals. I think I might just go thread local, guys. Can you store it in global allocator? Yes. Um, but I just don't think it makes too much sense to put it there. I think I'm actually going to... Um, we have boot args. We're going to have boot args on every thread. Serial in it. We only want to call on one thread. We're actually going to do this. Um, thread locals in it. Uh, the very, very fucking first thing we're going to do is uh, initialize thread locals. Yeah. So, initialize the thread locals. And this will be in kernel source thread. Thread local, thread locals. Thread locals. Yeah, we'll do this. Uh, pub fn init. Initialize the thread locals for this uh, for this core, and this is going to take a boot args static boot args uh, print, uh, and we we can't print yet because <laughs> we haven't enabled printing, which is fine. This is going to be uh, this file is used to hold and uh, access all of the thread locals. Um, okay, so struct thread locals, boot args, static boot args. We're actually gonna be able to uh, bring up all the cores uh, really soon here. We're actually not gonna have to do an ACPI walk because we don't have to bring them up one at a time. Uh, uh, we will. We will. Never mind. This file is used to access all the thread. Uh, hold and access all the thread locals. Um, all thread locals for the system. If we want more thread locals, we add them to the structure. Uh, a reference to the boot loader arguments. Okay. So, we're going to hit that init. Here we're going to have a uh, core count, uh, const core static, uh, cores online, this is atomic u size, atomic u size new zero. This is going to be uh, a counter of all cores online. Okay. Uh, so then here we'll do a How much server performance gain do you normally achieve by writing custom customized kernels for application specific purposes uh, for fuzzing? I get uh, like a hundred to a thousand X speed up typically uh, Let's see here Use core sync atomic atomic u size and ordering, and we'll have a core ID u size uh, a unique uh, sequentially allocated identifier for this core. Uh, we shouldn't say core. I don't think. Because we will have thread locals. Ah. Yeah, we only care about cores. These are more core locals at this stage. I might not want to call these thread locals because that might be confusing to some people. These are going to be local to the core. Um. Uh, 
and then the core locals can have thread locals in there. So, uh, core locals. Okay. Initialize the core locals. So, we only hit the entry. We'll allocate those every time we hit entry. Uh, MV kernel source thread locals, kernel source core locals. Um, and we'll worry about MM in a bit. Mod core locals. Perfect, and this is going to take a boot args. And since it's static, we can keep that around forever. Okay. Uh, boot arguments. Oh, kernel source core locals. Boot args, not found in the scope. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, use boot args, boot args. And then these will be set up for this core. Uh, thread locals core thread core locals all core locals. Um, this is going to be the uh, unique data structures. Uh, a a core exclusive data structure which can be accessed via the core macro. Uh, note that this um, note that this structure uh, hmm. uh, I want to feel, feel through that one second. Here's the core locals for this core. Uh, we'll just say initialize the locals for this core. And then here can be accessed through the core macro and then we will have a um, core exclusive data structure which can be accessed via the core macro and what do we want to do here <sighs> one second chat I'll catch up in a minute a core exclusive data structure which can be accessed via the core macro. Note that while this is unique to the core, it's possible that an interrupt can occur and this will still be the core local. And that's important to note because it means that if you have access, you can't assume that access to a field in here uh, is 100% safe in all cases. I actually might need to mark this as not sync. Uh, this will still be the core local. These will still be the core locals. Um, so if we're single threaded, it, it literally doesn't matter. This is, this is safe. Uh, this structure will not be sync. Yeah, we want to make sure that none of this stuff can be shared. Uh, it could technically share a pointer to this data structure. And then everything in here is going to be immutable. We're gonna have things like ref cells in here. Yeah, this is this is sync. Um, if we put ref cells, yeah, I think this is not sync, not send. So uh, here, okay, here's my concern. 
My concern is that I could express a, let's see, can I use a ref cell here? Technically, no. And it's really, really weird, but technically, no. Um... I don't know, I might allow cells and ref cells. Even though it technically could be unsafe. I don't wanna have I don't want a core to have to lock the core locals. Or I need to make this a task local structure and make sure that this make sure that interrupts will immediately switch to a new task local. And that way I can guarantee that this is exclusive in any thread of execution. Um, to do that, how would I do that? So I can have a different interrupt table per core, that's easy. So without interrupts, this is totally safe. I can have ref cells and cells and everything and there's exclusive access to this and it's fine. Uh, and we don't need to mark it, not send and not sync. Um, Can they be atomic pointers so they're pointing to boxes? Not in this case. So the, the biggest reason for this, where it could potentially be a problem. Um, so I'm gonna make a core local structure. So let's say the BSP, the first core comes online. It calls core locals init. We're gonna allocate a core local structure and then we're going to put that in the GS base so it can access it through GS in any context. It'll be able to get these core locals, which will kind of give us a basis to some system level things that we want access to. Now, the problem is if an interrupt occurs, so let's say we had a, um, a foop, and this is a uh, core cell ref cell U64. Now, if we have... If we have someone who has a ref count on this, so this this ref cell is not atomic, right? Ref cell doesn't use uh, atomic references, so it's theoretically possible that I could get mutable access to something. No, actually, does it matter? It might not matter. Um, if an interrupt somehow came through and we access this, by the time we, I think we're actually fine here. And th this is this is really strange. I think it's only really for ref cell. Um, mm. So by the time that I get a reference, so if I did, let's say core locals dot foop, dot borrow mute by the time that borrow mute returns and i bound a value into a the ref count has increased and if i have an interrupt that occurs during that phase i guess depending on the atomicity of this it's possible that we could fuck up the ref count like ruin the ref count it doesn't have to be atomic if you're accessing it from one core um maybe because if ref cell, right, if ref cell grabs the reference, adds one to it, and then stores the reference, it is theoretically possible that an interrupt could incur between those instructions. And we could grab the ref count, update it, add one, 
and it's currently in a temporary field with the ref count now being off by one and it will rewrite the old ref count over it. It technically can happen. And when it technically can happen, I'm not happy with it because it's not provably safe in all situations. So to protect against that, um, let's see. I think this is valid, right? Yes. Um, and we're going to do history C. Uh, okay. So I need to make sure that we cannot put a ref cell in core locals, and I don't know if I can do that. Uh, impl not sync for core locals. I... Uh, actually, if I do this, yeah, well, that's unsafe impl. Yeah, so it's supposed to inherit the negative impl. Negative impuls can't be unsafe. Yeah, that's fine. Um... Let me see. I don't think this is going to do what I want it to do. But I want it to not allow me to have a ref cell in here. And it will allow me to do that. Yeah. Because it's already not sync. Uh, can I require that it sync? Um... I need to compile time, make sure that the structure is not sync. Unsafe impulse sync for core locals. I'm pretty sure that'll override it and it will work. Yeah. You can unsafe impl and that's fine. That's why it's unsafe, yeah. Um... I need to make sure that this structure is sync. I could do that by wrapping it in something. <laughs> and I could do it with this. Can you write a test for it? Um, actually, assert uh, Rust assert trait implemented, and I don't think there's going to be a way. Yeah. If there's a way to do it, it's going to be uglier than literally doing this. Core locals is a T, where T implements sync. And it's just a T. <laughs> and struct locals, right? Right. <laughs> like, this works, right? Um, uh, rust, rust, struct, trait bound. Unless I can do it just on the struct, but I don't think so. Ah. Uh, Okay, I can do it in a, in a strange way. Creating it is fine. It's accessing that's unsafe, right? Impl for core locals. Can I do this? No, you can't. I mean, I can wrap it in the other structure. I'm just trying to see if there's a way that I can do do it without wrapping it in another structure, which would... It's just kind of gross. I don't like that. Um, trait X. I see what you're, I see what you're saying. Uh, trait X... 
that requires a sync. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Impl x for core locals. Awesome. Thank you, Desu. That is the trick. Um, core guard. And we'll just say this core guard. Uh, traits. Uh, empty marker trait that requires uh, sync. Uh, sync such that we can compile time assert that core locals is sync. And I might want to do that on boot args too. No, boot args is a global, so that one's fine. Okay. And yeah, now we can't share it between cores. Great, if we get rid of that field, we can. Bam! Fuck yeah. Beautiful. Okay, so now we require that core locals is sync. Um, this structure must be uh, sync since it's possible that uh, since the same core locals will be used during an interrupt on this core. So then the core locals can actually have a list of tasks. And the tasks can be like uh, thread locals up to like eight or something like that. And then the current task can be a field in here or like current interrupt depth or something and the task indexes this by the interrupt depth, and these are all atomic pointers and whatever, and we can ensure the safety there by making sure, based on the interrupt depth, that you have an exclusive access to some thread locally type thing. So we can totally make that work. Okay. So core locals, sequentially allocated things. So here we're gonna make the core locals. You're still here? Here, hell yeah. We don't stop. What if a process quits when desynced? Processes won't quit. There's no, uh, there's no exit processes in this. Um. You can panic, but if you panic, you're done, forever. Your core is gone. If you panic, your core is no longer going to execute ever again. <laughs> Processes don't quit, they're brutally terminated. Yeah, exactly. There's no, there's no reason to have exiting if, you're, if you don't have bugs. Okay. Um, so we can actually create an allocation here. So uh, allocate the... Uh, we're gonna allocate the core locals. Actually, how the fuck do we wanna do this? We wanna allocate the, at this point we wanna do everything in virtual memory. So we're gonna have like a bootstrap virtual memory allocator, uh, potentially. So this is our virtual memory allocator. And this we have the page table we created a new page table in the other, so it was exclusive. Now here, we're gonna want a page table that we make from, we're gonna want a page table global that we initialize once. So let's see if we do a static. Yeah, we're gonna have like a memory manager init for the first core. Technically, we can allocate these structures out of physical memory, but I don't wanna do that. Uh, I mean, for these structures, it might not matter. We might be fine putting them in physical memory. 
so so far we just have we have physical memory identity mapped and we could we could pretty easily right now allocate this structure in physical memory If I do it in physical memory, it makes things a little bit cleaner here. And I think I'm fine with these being allocated out of physical memory, actually. There's no ramifications to it. It's a fixed size structure. Um, yeah, and here we can even say that it needs to be sized, right? So then here, if we did ASDF slice, this will fail, right? Um, yeah. So that'll make sure that it's sync and size. So it's a fixed size thing. We don't have to worry about any of that being dynamic. I think we're just going to allocate that out of physical memory. So we're going to uh, allocate the thread locals out of physical memory. Uh, or in this case, the core locals. Um, and this way, we don't have to have the virtual memory. Like, we could bootstrap a virtual allocation here, but there's just no fucking reason. We have access to physical memory. Might as well. It's also column aligned in the code. Yeah, it is. I like that. Okay. So we're going to do this uh, boot args, uh, boot args dot, and we can set up the task locals in virtual memory. So we'll start off. We have no interrupts right now. So we're going to initialize the locals for this core. Um, Boot args free memory dot lock, and this is let me pmem is equal to this. Let pmem is equal to pmem as mute unwrap. That unwrap is fine. The only way that that would ever cause a panic is if somehow we haven't initialized physical memory by the point that we've already loaded up a fucking kernel. <laughs> so, uh, get access to the physical memory allocator. And then here we're going to do pmem.allocate uh, size, which will be uh, core mem size of core locals and core mem align of core locals. OK. We pretty much have to unwrap all these things at this stage. Uh, core locals. So for the size and with the alignment, these are as U64, as a U64. OK. So we allocate those out of physical memory. And this returns a, what is this, a U64? No, we got a U size. OK. So we have a U size, and we're going to convert that into a um, maybe on in it. Because it's uninitialized right now. Um. OK, yep. Yeah, I think we just have to make it. Yeah, how do we?
Um, maybe on an it, blah, 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 blah. How do we create one of these things? I think we can just cast to a maybe on an it. I think. I think it's guaranteed it's always the same size. No support away, blah, blah, blah. Guaranteed to have the same size alignment and ABI as a T. Type containing that is maybe not the same, blah, blah, blah. Guarantees, uh, Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I can make this a maybe on an it. And then that has a right. Oh, uh, we can do that pointer right to it. Yeah, so we'll grab, uh, use core pointer, core mem. Maybe on an it. Let core locals is equal to an allocate of this. Let core locals is equal to uh, core locals as a mutable pointer to a maybe on an it t. Uh, maybe on init core locals. Beautiful. Um, I don't know. Maybe the maybe on and it's just going to be confusing because we're just going to write to it. Yeah, I think it's just going to be confusing. Um, we're going to do a pmem dot uh, we'll do a core pointer right to core locals as as a mutable reference to a core locals which is what it is. And we will write a core local structure. We'll do this. Okay, so we will write the uh, core ID, which will be uh, cores online fetch add one ordering sequentially consistent. We're going to grab a, a boot args from boot args, and we can just make a copy of that reference. Okay, so this is going to be allocate the core locals. This will be initialize the core locals. And then at this stage, uh, we'll do want to do a write GS base, and that's going to be... Um, Uh, GS base. It's like three three eighty or some shit. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Uh, GS base MSR. Colonel GS. Uh, actually, just GS base. Colonel GS base, and then the GS base. With the Colonel GS base, we don't want that. Um. GS base using a single uh, right MSR. Okay, this is GS base. Uh, GS base. Uh, E64. We're gonna put that in uh, shared CPU source. So we're going to have a um, write and MSR inline pub unsafe FN write MSR MSR, which is a U32 value, which is a U64. Uh, we'll assembly. So I think it's the MSR is in ECX. So we can just do a right MSR we'll have a memory clobber here because we don't actually know so we'll have the the MSR value will go into ECX the high part of the value will go into um, EDX val shift 32 uh, and we'll just do this Unless we have a right MSR, but I don't think we do. We do not. Okay. So ECX is going to get the MSR. EDX is going to get the Val Shift 32 as a U32. I like to explicitly cast all this stuff to be extra careful. And then EAX will get the low part. And let's just make sure we did that right. Uh... I'm pretty sure those are the conventions. EDX, EAX, and DECX. Yep. MSR and ECX. EDX is the high part of the value. And write an MSR. 32. And that works in 32-bit and 64-bit modes. Perfect. And now we're going to have a pub fn set gs base. This is just going to take the base u64 uh, inline. This will set the gs base uh, for the current core, of course. Uh, set the gs base. We'll just say that. And then here we can say um, this is just a right MSR of OXCOO. 101, I think is what it was. Uh, base. Uh, unsafe. 0101. Yep, perfect. And then in core locals, we'll just use CPU, which I think we have access to in the kernel. Maybe we haven't used CPU yet in the kernel, so we might have to grab that quick. Uh... Initialize the core locals. And in this case, we'll do um, let uh, core locals, core local pointer. This will be core local pointer. And then this will be core locals, will be equal to the core local structure. We're going to try and set up this structure in safe code. Because if we can, if we can do anything in safe code, we're going to do it in safe code. We're not going to use unsafe if we don't need to. So we're going to um, construct the core locals. And then here we're going to uh, write or move the core locals into the allocation. Move the core locals into the allocation. In this case, we will write it to uh, core locals. And that has now been moved into that location. 
and thus we will now prevent drop from ha happening, of course, on that, just in case we do dynamic allocations in there, which we won't for a while. Okay, uh, next thing we're going to do is we will add... Um, move the core locals into the allocation. Then we're going to... Um, move the core locals into the allocation. Okay. And then we're going to CPU uh, set GS base. And we'll set the GS base to the core local pointer as a U64. Done. Okay. And now we need to represent this structure. Because this is going to be um, self. I think I can do this. This is going to be uh, mute core locals. This is going to be a pointer to ourself. And I guess that is a keyword. Um, oh, I can say this. <laughs> Uh, yeah. We'll just say this. Um, uh, core local address. The address of this structure. Uh, the address of this structure. Cool. Core local address. And here we're going to say um, JavaScript flashbacks. Uh, and this will be a core local pointer. And we represent that structure. Yeah, we did. Uh, we're going to say core local adder. Actually, we're just going to say the address. Okay, and then since we represent that, we know that the address will always be the very first thing in the structure. And that now means uh, we will be able to get that. So I'm going to set the course online to 1024 for now. And now we're going to make a macro. Macro rules core. No args. This is going to return. Uh, this will get us access to our own core locals. And the way that we'll do this is. I think we've got to use inline assembly here. Friends and friends and pals. Uh, let's uh, pointer. This is a U64, technically a U size. Uh, we're going to do a move into a register from uh, GS colon zero. So we're going to deref at the GS base. We're going to deref the zero thing, which will be the address. So that will give us the, um, the address of the structure itself. And that's why it needs to be self-referential. And now this is going to take one input as a register. Uh, actually, this will output one register into a uh, pointer no inputs uh we're gonna say a memory clobber here because i like doing that volatile and intel syntax on this assembly of course this is unsafe very unsafe and we'll do this and then at this point i can say uh honestly we can just make the whole thing unsafe Unsafe code, and then we'll do uh, mute, uh, or we'll do pointer as mute, as const uh, core locals, and then deref it and turn it into a Rust reference. So this 
will give us a Rust reference to this. So now I can do, um, and I need to export that macro. We'll do that in a second. Uh, so we'll do, we'll initialize, uh, initialize the serial port. Uh, this must be the first thing that happens. Okay, so at this point I should be able to print a uh, core dot, I think I have core ID. We'll just do ID, it's implied that it's for the core. Uh, print's not in the scope. Yeah, we'll do, uh, oops, serial print. And no macro core. Um, use core locals uh, core. We'll do those modules first. And we need a macro export that I think. I mean, we could, no, I actually like the macro, uh, core locals core. Oh, pub, pub, uh, ooh, we kind of don't want that pub. We're going to, we're going to mark it pub temporarily, but, uh, core locals and this we want to do, um, Crate. Fuck. How do I get the current? Oh, make that make the current project one. Yeah, I should do that. Hi. Uh, my recommender sent me here. I guess I'm more of a programmer than a, a gamer. Uh, can I check somewhere of what you're working on? Okay, sweet. So you got the link. Sorry, I've been uh, ignoring chat. Uh, yeah, I'm building a bootloader and kernel. Yep. In the Rust programming language, it's a research project. May or not be, may or may not be used for uh, fuzzing in the future. Yeah, we'll do a, we'll impl get ID and stuff on that. Um. Okay. So there's got to be a way to do. Um. Rust macro module. It's got to be a way that I can get the current. Yeah. Macro across module files, and then let's see. Oh, that's across crates. Yeah, I don't need to have macro export in this. Um. Oh, maybe I do. Okay, uh, will e be exported at the root. Oh, sweet, that's exactly what I want. Nice, perfect, 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 perfect. Asm. Okay, and then crate. So I know the path is crate locals, but I am curious if there is a, a dollar sign Module path. Okay, nice. Uh, I actually don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do that here. I think I need like one of the dollar sign things. Yeah, that's not it. Uh, module path. Wait, can I do that? Yeah, no. Uh... I mean, I can literally just do this. But 
but I, I, I don't know. I there's I feel like there's got to be a way. Um, Rust crates. I don't know if I can Google. Yeah, I can't do that. Rust crate. How the fuck do you escape characters? I really hate that shit. Like, there's just no way to do that. Uh, Rust crate dollar sign macro. Ugh. Crate. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter too much, but, um, oh, well, oh, it's fine. No, I don't need it as a string. Um, I mean, this works, right? I just, I was just wondering if I could get the module. Actually, let me just try that. I, I didn't try that. Module? mod yeah whatever we'll do this okay so this builds cargo run clean cargo run no warnings no errors nice build time by the way okay and we print 1024 yeah it works that printed the core uh print printed the core id so yeah at this point we can now use the core macro anywhere in our kernel and that will give us access to these core locals which uh, we can use to get different things like the core identifier. We can use it to get the boot args. Um, honestly, I can actually make that pub. I can make that pub because it's not mutable. I will never give out a mutable reference to this structure. You'll never have a mutable reference to this, ever. So if I tried to do a core ID is five, right? Can't assign there. So. We can actually make that pub. We can make this pub. Can't assign to him. Why isn't this a function? Uh, it just allows me to use it everywhere, and I kind of like the concept of using a um, a macro for something like this rather than using a function. Like, yeah, I could do like <laughs> core. Uh, but I like how this is highlighted, and it shows up a little bit more obvious that there's some stuff going on here that's kind of interesting. Um, that's the only reason. It's mainly just for the like sugar of looking a little bit more standout-ish. That's it. Um, but yeah, I could have like get get thread locals get locals or something or, or get core locals or just call it core uh but i like it as a macro because i think core works better as a macro but i wouldn't want to have a function called core i i don't think so having core is like fetch the core locals can we make it so the macro only creates a function call i mean we could um Like, I could have this call the, like, get core locals or something. Is there a strong reason for that? Just, like, cleanliness? Or do you just not like that this is a macro? Feel like it shouldn't be the macro. Yeah. I mean, I don't like having functions with this short of names, to be honest. Uh, being able to macro export and have this in the global namespace is really nice. 
because I can use core anywhere in my kernel without having to use core every single spot that I ever use it. Um, let's see, one second here. But yeah, uh, but yeah, we can make this. Uh, we can make this a uh, pub fn get core locals. I, I'm totally for this. And then the macro is just a shortcut. That's all it is. Um, this is an a ref. I mean, quite frankly, this is kind of static. Uh, It'll live forever, even though it's not technically static, because it won't exist during the very, very early boot phases, because we create it dynamically. We'll never free it again. Uh, so, in my book, that's static. In fact, I think that is uh, actually valid in Rust. You can, yeah, you can turn a lifetime into a static one if you don't free it, if you forget it. get the core locals, uh, get a reference to the current core locals. And then this will just be a create a core locals, get core locals. Um, oh, and then this one, we don't have to do this anymore, right? Okay, so here we're gonna say get the first uh, uh, u64 from core locals, which given we don't change the structure shape, should be the address of the core locals. We're gonna mark this inline. Okay, get core locals. That'll give us access to the core locals. This will just be a macro. Um, a shortcut to get access to the core locals. Okay, and then that's in the global space, so we can just do ID on that. Perfect. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say if a core ID is zero. So we're gonna initialize the core locals on all the cores. And then uh, this is going to be uh, one time initialization for the whole kernel. So if the core ID is zero, uh, then we want to do these things. We want to initialize the serial port. We want to do a bunch of other shit. Um, and this is done for the first uh, core. And the first core is the only one that will do this. If we bring up other cores, they will have a core ID atomically incremented, off cores online, starts at zero, which means you'll have core ID one, two, three, four, so on and so forth, atomically guaranteed. So this will make sure that this is the one-time initialization, and this will set things up that we don't want to keep reinitializing when every core comes online. Why can't you get a pointer from GS? Uh, you can't LEA GS, so there's no way that you can actually get the address of that. You can do read MSR, to get the GS base, but read MSR is a like 50 to 80 cycle microcode invoking instruction, whereas the DREF is literally just a memory access to the processor. So it's a common trick that you'll see in a lot of operating systems. So yeah, there's no way that we can get the address of that. Um. I would love to be able to LEA GS colon zero, but you can't. So it's weird. It's some weird stuff. Yep. So yeah, we're able to deref it instantaneously as a memory access, like 
one to four cycles, right? If it's an L in cash, which it will be. Um, otherwise, the best, second best way we can get it is through read MSR, which is potentially hundreds of cycles. Yes. Really interesting. Okay. Um, okay, so we have the page table stuff. We're going to keep that up for reference. Boot args. Honestly, we're going to pass that serial port up. I don't want to reinitialize the serial port. Uh, so we're going to have the serial part, port be part of boot args. Um, maybe? Yeah, but then I have no access to it. Shit. Uh, oh, here's what we can do. Um, oh, yeah, we do need to use it in boot args if we want the lock to be shared between the bootloader and the kernel. To do that, we would need to have... We would need to pass that to serial, because serial is who provides our print macro. So we could potentially have our print macro managed by the bootloader or the kernel itself which would then have access to boot args in all contexts. Um, and that might be the play. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to do. The print macro is relatively simple. Um, that also means we can global it. Uh, yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to go SP shared serial source and initializing the serial port will actually return a new serial port structure. Might want to mark get uh, core locals is inline. I already did. I think, yeah. Okay. So we're gonna temporarily break the serial subsystem. This is gonna initialize all found serial ports to this and return um, the parse uh, the identified devices. Okay, so that's here we're just going to do a new self. Uh, oh yeah, this will be fn. It won't be public. So this will call serial port new. And this uses self, uh, so we'll do let mute ret is equal to serial port devices none for uh, create an uh, a new serial port uh, driver. Go through each of the ports. Here we're gonna do ret self. Okay, so here we can do, we can actually make these public because we need mutable access to self to use these, which will make sure that we have a lock. Okay. So then in this case, uh, and then, yep, we want our turn ret at the end. Perfect. And then at 94, we're going to comment all of this out temporarily. It's going to break a lot of stuff. See report, can't leak private type. Yep, public. Uh, yeah, I mean, technically, things could init this multiple times. 
there's really no good way for me to do that. So I think I'm going to say unsafe. Um, that way... That way, if you call this multiple... Like, it's on you to understand. Um, uh, this should only ever be called once. Uh, hence, it is marked unsafe. Okay. Um, and we can also say uh, this also assumes that memory is identity mapped such that OX400 is a valid pointer to the uh, BIOS data area. Um, memory is identity map such that that is a valid pointer to the BIOS data area. Okay, good. So now, in bootloader, we're now going to serial init. Uh, let mute serial is equal to this. Thank you for all the follows, everyone. Hope you're having fun. Serial, uh, serial port new. We'll say unsafe. Um, and this is going to be create the serial port driver. And we're going to do that once per boot. We're going to grab that from serial, use serial, serial port. Okay. Serial colon colon. We're just going to use print now. And no print, no print, no print, no print. No serial print. That is on SP source uh, bootloader source panic. Here and SP source uh, bootloader source pixie. Okay. Nice. Serial no longer needs lock cell. That makes sense. Uh, so let's go into uh, shared serial cargo toml, get rid of lock cell, uh, SP shared serial source lib, and then we're just going to steal this from the serial stuff, and then this will just whack into SP uh, bootloader source print.rs, and that's just going to make a dummy there. Uh, we don't have thread local. How the fuck are we going to get access to serial here? We can actually... Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, we have access to boot args. Fuck yeah. Okay, I did think that through. I was about to say, I'm pretty sure I thought this all the way through, and there are no ramifications. Um, okay, uh, mod print. Okay, yep, no serial writer, because that is it. Print serial writer. Okay, and then these are... Uh, and is that just not working because that's not implemented? No. Uh, do I need to use that module first? How did I get that globally working up here? Core locals, because I can use core. Why can I do that? 
Oh, it's because these are under it. Uh, macro use. Okay, perfect. Mod print. Wait. Oh, that's in the kernel. Oh, okay, okay. Woof, woof. So macro use. All right, and now that's gonna go in boot args. Yay! Boot args source lib. Uh, we're gonna put this in here. This is gonna be a uh, the serial driver pub serial, and this is a lock cell. Serial port. Fuck yeah. And this will be an option. So it'll be none until it gets initialized. Dude, this is gonna be so nice. Dude, this is gonna be so nice. Oh my god. Oh. Oh, I can't wait, man. Uh, Vim shared boot args uh, cargo. Okay, missing serial. Perfect. Same thing, serial. Wow. Uh, and then here we can do create the serial port driver, and we'll do this with a lock. We'll do uh, serial is equal to boot args dot serial dot lock. Um, get access to the serial port uh, serial driver. If serial is none, uh, driver has not yet been set up. Initialize the ports. And now, we can actually just put all the threads right through entry. Uh, that'll be my goal. I'd like all core, all, uh, yeah, all cores on the system to just blast right through the entry. Uh, such that I don't have to mux too much and treat them as separate. So here we're gonna get, we're gonna lock that serial. We're going to say if serial is none, then we'll do uh, serial is equal to unsafe serial port new, and that's unsafe just because it has that BDA requirement. And there we go, we'll wrap this in a sum. So there we go, we've set up the serial driver. And mark that mute. So now, only one core will end up setting that up. Fuck yeah! Okay, and then we got this, and this is now boot args serial dot lock dot write. Uh, I'm okay using crate in this case. Uh, oh yeah, it's a, it's an option. Oh, so we'll say if let sum. Serial is equal to this. Serial dot writes this. What the fuck? Oh, there. Okay, if serial port and then um as mute. So we'll get there we go, that built the bootloader, and we're good. And we should be able to print and do everything now. Uh, and then we need to make another copy of this. We'll do the same thing for the kernel. SP kernel source print.rs paste uh, to implement print. We don't have boot args. Uh-oh, that's a problem, right? That's a problem. But no fear, let's pull this in here. 
uh, macro use mod print. And biggest name, yeah, we're uh, SP kernel source panic. And we're not hitting eh personality, so we can get rid of that. Serial init in main in kernel. Ooh. Serial ports already initialized. Oh no, we don't have boot args in print. Oh, what are we gonna possibly do? Oh, well, I guess we'll have to use core boot args. Uh, and we gotta macro use that, don't we? On core locals. Fuck. Ordering matters? Ordering matters. Okay. Um... So now, they are actually all using the same lock. Fuck yeah! So now the physical memory, uh, the physical memory allocations and the serial port are shared. Uh, they're both shared between the bootloader and the kernel. My face when it works. <laughs> it's ordering! <laughs> yeah, I guess macros are like, uh, <laughs> they behave like C includes. I will say that's one thing I do not miss from uh, C, is having include ordering matter. Fuck yeah, so that's, uh, that's in really good shape now. Uh, let's reboot that. Okay, and then we're gonna do a... There we go. Managing my tibia makers, how to grab runes. Okay. Um, fuck yeah. Created a map, it mapped that in, entry point out there. Okay. Um, I think this is pretty solid. Let's go through our files. This is going to be a, um, well, that's the kernel memory manager. We'll get to commenting that in a bit. This is commented, commented, uh, the main kernel entry point. Page table, ooh, uh, Routines for creating and manipulating four level uh, x86 64 page tables. MM. This is a uh, memory management routines for the uh, bootloader allocator. Boot orgs. We've been doing this format. Okay, this is the uh, routines for using the real mode uh, 16 uh, real mode uh, Pixie APIs as provided by the uh, BIOS and or option ROMs. Pixie guard, we have a guard on that. Yep, and we prevent access, so that's that's thread safe. Technically, we could have another core come up and boot another fucking kernel. <laughs> we could literally bring another core online and just have it make a new page table and boot a whole different kernel. <laughs> Are we gonna fucking do that? Dude, that's so cool! Oh, this is so versatile! Fuck yeah!
Okay, this is, um, uh, just a basic, uh, basic, uh, uh this is just a, a print macro support. Okay. Only exists for boot args. We have that open twice. Uh, print macro support. Uh, main Rust entry point, main kernel entry point. Okay. Cargo run clean, cargo run. Git status, git add kernel bootloader. Shared git status, git commit am, booted into uh, 64 bits, uh, kernel loaded by the bootloader as a PE, git push. Okay, history C, cargo run, clean, cargo run. Oh yeah. Uh, can we build those in parallel? We totally can. We don't have to build the bootloader, then the kernel. We could technically just have those start building in parallel, um, because they both have to link at different times. So, that's something we could add support for. And this is the uh, uh, Rust entry point for the uh, bootloader. And these are the uh, global arguments shared between the kernel and bootloader. It is critical that every structure in here is identical in shape between both 64-bit and 32-bit represent representations. Uh, and let's go into uh, shared serial source and let's represent this. Represent. That'll make sure that that's represent. Oh, I do have to make project. Let me do that quick. Um, The problem is the project changes, and so it's never going to be up to date, <laughs> right? Every stream I do something different. So, yeah, let's fucking see here. Uh, but we'll put it in here. Commands. Uh. Chocolate milk. That and then uh, project this. Okay. Okay. Allow bot to change using the bang project, project name. Yeah, I should do that. Do it first thing every stream. Yeah, you know, I used to, at before when I started streams, I would like have my mic muted and shit. So at least that muscle memory is getting fixed. But every new thing I add is like a new thing to forget every stream. But, uh, and then I also added chocolate milk and I might add a small description for it and I could update the um, title of the stream to have bang project. So people know to type that command to test it out. But, okay, that's fucking great, guys. Wow, get access to serial driver. Uh, driver has not been set up yet, initialize the ports. Cool. Uh, then we're going to initialize the MMU. And let's see what we can do here. Uh, do we have this panic? Yeah, we're just gonna have this return. Uh, if pmem 
is sum return none uh, return uh, and this will be uh, if the memory manager uh, if the if physical memory has already been initialized just return out okay so then we should be able to call mm init um, get access to the serial driver Uh, initialize the serial driver, initialize the MMU. Then here we're going to set up a download the kernel, parse a PE, uh, get exclusive access to physical memory, create a new page table, create a four gig identity map, load all of the uh, sections, create a stack in this new page table, uh, print the entry point, and then we're going to jump into it here. So this should, right now, support multiple cores. Literally, right fucking now. Now this is going to this is gonna download and load multiple kernels. They're going to be completely separate kernels that it's going to download and boot from, which is going to be fucking hilarious. Uh, but we can literally do this. So we're going to um, uh, bring up all other cores, and we're gonna do this using, uh, called the init sippy sippy sequence. <laughs> and we send, uh, we have to use the apic to send, uh, the init command, which is going to cause all of the other cores to be initialized. Uh, and that is basically very similar to a reset. If we go to sandpile.org, uh, you'll see that init this is the reset state. This is like a, a physical processor reset. And this is the init state, which is a signal, uh, an IPI, an interprocessor interrupt that we can send to other cores. Um, and we can do this all through the APIC. Uh, technically, we need to detect and identify where our APIC is. But right now, we know that it's at, uh, <laughs> we can do a core pointer write volatile. To O X F E E O O one two three four. Yeah, I think that's where it is. F E E, some some shit like that. Uh, F E E. This might actually be part of here. Apic base. F E E O nine if it's BSP. Else eight. Interesting. Okay, so the Apic base actually will change where it's at. Uh, but the BIOS has probably remapped it there, so, yeah. We're going to take a look at the APIC. Uh, that's going to be... That's APIC virtualization. APIC right here. So, we're going to be accessing the local APIC. We want to... Technically, we should check if the APIC is actually present and supported. We should also determine if we're using an X2 APIC. Uh, basic operating mode is the X APIC mode. The X2 APIC mode is an extension, and I think we have to um, enable that. So X2 APIC is actually what you need if you're bringing up more than 256 processors. Actually, more than 255, because the APIC... Um, only allows using a byte for addressing the processors. So we'll actually use X2 APIC uh, pretty soon here. Um, but we're going to just hack this in temporarily. Uh, initial starting space of here. Correct. And then we just care. This is uh, all the shit you can do. Um, and we just care about the... Uh, I think it's this. EOIs to end an interrupt that you got. Local destination register. These are where you put the uh, vectors for different timers. Oh, ICR. I think it is the ICR. Yeah, yeah, 300 and 310 for sure. Um, so to do this, we have to write the low part and the high part to the ICR. And I think you write the high part first. And then the low part, when you write to that, it latches the high part and sends off the interrupt. Uh, 
It's been, it's been, a, it's been a while. Hey, we did, we did implement a 64-bit page table implementation without referring to the spec. Did we not? <laughs> did we not? <laughs> oh, here's the initial states after, oh, that's the wait for sippy shit. Um. Uh, oh, issuing IPIs. Okay, we use the ICR, destination field, uh, vector. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to send, uh, by we, yeah, Twitch chat. Twitch chat did that. So uh, basically, we're going to send an init to all other processors, and that's going to cause them to become initialized. Now... People in, in OS dev land is, are going to hate what I'm about to do because I'm about to use all excluding self. And all excluding self allows me to bring up all... It allows me to send an interrupt to everyone except for myself. I can send one to myself. I can do all including self. But all excluding self will send an IPI to all processors on the system. Now... A lot of OS dev people are going to say, never do this. You should identify which processors are enabled in the ACPI tables. And because the BIOS might disable certain cores, and you might be bringing up cores that the BIOS was expecting to have disabled, and you might have weird shit going on. Uh, but right now, we don't have ACPI tables. We haven't parsed those yet. We haven't done anything. We don't even have a virtual memory manager yet in our kernel, although we can have one in like two seconds. But we're going to bring up other cores right now because I'm I'm excited. So we're going to send to all, including self, bits 18. We're going to send a um, init signal, which is here. So uh, I think it's like CO40 or some shit. Uh, and yeah, it does look like that. Uh, CO400. No, CO500. Huh. Is it? CO500, and then it's CO6, and then the vector, and we'll get into that in a second. Uh, but yeah, bits 18, 00, 5 for init, and that goes up to here. Yeah, it's CO, it's CO500, I'm pretty sure. So that's going to send an init, and then we're going to send a sippy sippy. And I don't know why you do it twice, because technically you can normally do it once. But the, uh, the init's going to initialize them. It's basically going to reset the all other cores except for ourself. And then the uh, sippy, which is the startup IPI, uh, this is actually a really weird one. So you pass it the startup IPI, and then the vector if I'm not mistaken, is the page index of where you want execution to start. Um, level flag must be zero and trigger mode flag to one. Oh, that's deassert init. Yeah, I don't need to do that shit. Uh, send an init, send a startup IPI. And the vector typically points to a startup routine that is part of the BIOS bootstrap code. IP sent with this delivery mode are not automatically retired uh, if the source APIC is unable to deliver it. Yeah, so if we look at this, uh, this will tell us the SIPI, and I'm pretty sure it's the page. Here's the init SIPI SIPI sequence. Um, Do, do, do. Adds it to the table, blah, blah, blah. So it brings them up, kind of programs all that shit. Oh, we need to give them unique stacks. Fuck. If, if, 
if we're bringing them all up at the same time, they need to somehow get their own stacks. Any codes? Hey, what's going on? The Major, thank you for the sub. Hell yeah. <laughs> you need to give them unique stacks. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> um... Oh, yeah, here's the vector. Yep, it's the page. So you give it the page, and V is the vector from the SIPI message. So, for example, if we were to say 008, this will boot from 8,000 hex. And remember, we're booting from 7C00. So this will cause us to bring those up uh, pretty close to nearby. Let's. Uh, these are U32s as cons. Uh, as mute U32. Um, as mute U32, and this is at 300. I'm pretty sure. As mute U32, and we have a four gig uh, map, so we should be fine. So this, in theory, is is probably just gonna crash pretty catastrophically. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess the other cores are crashing. The other cores are crashing, but that doesn't matter because we don't see them. <laughs> okay. So, uh, in our bootloader, uh, we have bootloader source main open already. Okay, in our bootloader main, we're going to print... At this stage, uh, we can use the serial port, so we'll print ASDF. Um, yeah, so they, they're not going to actually get to this entry point because we don't, uh, we don't handle those APs at all right now. So we have to go into bootloader source stage zero. Okay. So we are going to bring up the other cores at 8,000 hex. And to do that, we're going to times, uh, uh, OX8000 minus OX7C00 minus dollar minus, minus minus DB0. So we're going to pad until we're at 8,000. And then we're going to do this again for the, uh, we'll go to 9,000 for the, for the bootloader. We just broke everything, by the way. So this will no longer boot. Perfect. Yeah, it doesn't boot. Uh, and we don't really know if it's triple faulting. Actually... Yeah, I think that's the downside to using this console, is we can't see that it's triple faulting. It's triple faulting, guys. No surprise. Uh, that's because our bootloader is no longer at the location that it's supposed to be. So we're going to put our bootloader at... Uh, our bootloader we now expect to put at 9,000. Um, although we don't even need to do... We can do 16-byte uh, alignment, so we can actually put it on a tighter boundary than that. So we'll do that in a second here. Um, so we're going to aim to put our bootloader at 8100 because I don't want to have 4k of space. So this is going to add some dead space here because we have to pad to a page alignment. We're forced to. Due to the processor, it only allows us to use uh, these two parts of the address for the AP entry point. So here we're going to have uh, AP entry, CLI halt, jump, AP entry. OK. Is that because of 16-bit addressing? Uh, no, they just were, it's just the way that Intel hacked in their shitty um, uh, paging model. I mean, yeah, I guess technically. But. Or the, their shitty, not paging model, um, multi-threaded model. So almost every other processor in the world, just all the cores kind of come online right away. But uh, not on Intel. So the BIOS has probably already brought those cores online, done some stuff with them, and then turned them off. Um, and then we're going to init them to reset them to a known state. Okay. So we're going to do a... That's going to pull it up on AP entry, and then we just have to... I think we can fit this code in 256 bytes probably pretty easily. So we'll open up source main, and we're, we're going to say the kernel base 
the bootloader base for the Rust bootloader is going to be 8100. And that sh should fail. Perfect. Cargo on clean, cargo on. Uh, and stage zero gets built every time, so that one's fine. Source. Base address did not match. Ooh. Good. See, that's why we add those messages. Even though I knew I had to fix this up. It's still cool to do stuff like that. Uh, 7100. Perfect. So this should now boot again. And I think the other cores come online. So if I do an int 3 here. And maybe a UD2 for a good measure or something. Int 3. We'll try int 3. We're going to see if we triple fault. We do not. Let's try a UD2. Someone might have a handler for that. Yeah, someone might have a handler for that too. Um, uh, move zero D word uh, int zero. So this is going to uh, write over the handler. This is going to write over the handler for um, div by zero, and then we're going to do an int zero to cause a div by zero. Oh. Huh. Like this. Oh, DS might be fucked. Can I do this? I cannot. Uh, Zor. AX, AX, move DS, AX. And then here we'll do a, a div AX. Ooh. That means they might not be coming online. So we're going to do uh, ndisasm B16 uh, on bootloader, uh, on pixie bootloader. Chocolate milk boot. Vim dash. Uh, oh, and then here we can say the origin, I think. The origin is OX7C00. Okay, so these are the addresses of everything. 8000. Yep, that has that code. Okay, so we padded correctly, and then 8100. This has the start of our. Um, a PE, or our flattened, uh, loaded PE image. Okay, cool. So, that's working fine and dandy. That means we're not bringing up these other cores. Um, so, let's see. I might just cheat and go look at what the um, five and then six... I don't know. Kind of going off of memory here. There's also a chance that the APIC has not been enabled. Uh, 300. Yeah, because this is bit 16, 17, and then C0. Uh, C, uh, the C is bits, these two, all, all excluding self. That's correct. Uh, we got to enable the APIC. Um, when that is zero, blah, blah, blah. Enabling or disabling the local APIC. One of two ways. You can global enable disable and the APIC base MSR, MSR address 1B. When that is zero, it's functionally equivalent to uh, without an APIC. Interesting. When that is zero, without an onchic APIC, it's also set to zero. Oh, cool. The CPID flag goes away. Interesting. 
when that is set to zero, can't be, oh, they can't be re-enabled until a hardware reset. <laughs> See, x86 processors just have so many nice gems. You don't get, you don't get good stuff like that on ARM processors, where if you set that bit, you basically ruin the processor until you physically reset it. Until a full hardware reset. It's just, it's just the little things in life that are super nice about x86. Okay, um... Okay, got my backpacks. Alright. Doop doop doop. Sarcasm sign. <laughs> okay. Yeah, now I gotta feng shui my monk. Eh, hey, we did it. We did it. Okay. Nice. Okay. This. Heal. Shoop. Okay. We're back to normal. Okay. Uh, for processors that use uh, FSB delivery, blah, blah, blah. So, oh yeah, that is the BSP flag set to one for the processor selected as the BSP. And then this is global enable. And then the base field. So we want to set this. Uh, oh, here it is, nicely broken down. So, what is this MSR B6? 1B. Uh, so we'll do a CPU write MSR to 1B. F E E O. So we gotta be careful, we don't wanna do that. We wanna set one bit in there, which is bit 11. Or one shift 11. All right, that'll enable the other. That'll enable the APIC. In theory, maybe my Oracle for the other cores dying. Uh, let's let's do this. Um, Zor AX AX move uh, ES. Uh, we'll do this. Zor DI DI move AX OX OF thirty Stospa. CLI halt jump AP entry. Oh, and then Zor DI. Uh, oops. Move DI. It's been a while. B800. Uh, XOR DI DI. This is going to write a zero to the screen if that code executes, which it is not. Uh, okay, so that means we fuck something up. Global enable. Bit 11. Yep. Oh. Uh, okay. Well, I thought that was it. Fuck. That sets up the APIC base. ESDI, DIDI. 8,000. 608. Alright, let me take a look at some code quick. Um... Uh, what's a good one? Actually, orange slice. Oh, orange slice, we don't have cores. Grilled cheese. I don't know. Apic. We really do that in the MM? It's kind of weird. Apic. Net the Apic. Map it. Oh, we set the bottom. Oh, that's making the page table entry. Uh, APIC. Ah, that initializes the memory mapping of the APIC, but it doesn't actually enable the APIC. I see. Um, what else do we do? Uh, maybe I do that in interrupts in it. Uh, in it. 
Is interrupts in it really not in interrupts? Enable the APIC. Oh. Ah, uh, that's setting up the timer. Is it? No, it's not here. Uh, let's take a look at uh, beta. APIC. Uh, oh, Sippy. Oh my god, F-E-E. -E. Jesus Christ. Oh, whole words. Um, blah, blah, blah. Protected mode, that's going to jump into... I think everything might go through here. Sippy? Yeah, here's boot APs. Uh, C45. Oh, we have a 4 we're missing. What is that bit? So fucking close. Here we go. God damn it. Is that... <laughs> really? That's not it? We might need to add this slight sleep. Usually in, uh, in virtual machines, you don't have to do that. Here we enable the IOA pick. We OR1 the FIFO. Okay, we can do that. Let's take a look here. Core pointer writes volatile as me E32. Uh, FIFO as me U32 uh, core pointer read volatile this or OX 100 we'll, we'll figure out what this shit means in a second uh, that didn't do the trick So, oring it with a hundred. We can also do it without doing this, in theory. But I don't think that's gonna. Yeah, that's okay. We have multiple cores on this, right? Four. Let's make sure this code is getting hit. Um, print set sent and it sippy. Bits we count zero index, so the ninth. Um, this. I wish I could have, like, multiple of these things open. I don't know if I can. No, because I already have it open. Okay, set, and it's sippy sippy. Maybe we need the sleeps. C4, 6. C4, 5. Oh, oh. FEE 00300. Yep. C4609. C4608 in this case because we're booting from that location. I wonder if I need these. Uh, I wonder if those are needed. Maybe the init's not complete for this in 0 0.1000. 100,000, 10,000, 10, whatever that number is. Um, core, atomic, uh, sync, yield, I think is what it is. Was it yield? No. Sync. Uh, 
atomic spin loop hint. I think this will cause it to uh, not get optimized out, but I'm not sure. But I, I don't think this is the issue. Yeah, that's not it. Maybe, maybe this environment doesn't like the all but self. Or this has the X2 APIC enabled and it's using the X2 APIC. Um, if it's using the X2 APIC, you actually have to go through the, all right, maybe we'll start doing this code correctly then instead of trying to hack it in. I thought we were just gonna get this to go. I'm kind of surprised. Huh. Here's our AP entry code. B100, ESDI, DIDI, Stospa. That's at 8,000. Oh, fuck. It's probably been working this whole time. Yeah, there's the zero. <sighs> yep. Yep, that happened. So there are two different ways to enable the APIC, according to the manual, right? Or using the enable disable flag in the SPIV. I'm guessing if we write it, it will automatically set the, uh, the bit here. I don't know if I need to enable that as well. Given that it, you can do it either of two ways, given we're setting that base, I'm pretty sure that works. So we just set that base up ourselves and that should be fine to enable that APIC. Okay. We did it again. See, I, I knew I shouldn't doubt myself. What was the, what's the four bit? That's the, um, uh, this is, uh, 12, 13, 14, bit 14. What is that? Assert. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that's bringing those up, and then we just need uh, we need some core, uh, we need some stacks, stacks on stacks on stacks. Um, um are these seven magic? <laughs> this seven magic constants makes me cry inside. Can we construct them in constant ends? Nah, nah. Nah. How about the ex uh, extra bit in C45? So all the bits are accounted for now. The C4, the C is all but self. The four is assert. The five is uh, a knit. Okay, um, yeah, that's perfect. So we need to figure out how we want to handle these stacks. So we can either, um, what can we either? By the time these get pulled up, seven, the 7C00 stack is available for use again. Um,
And we should be able to have that jump to entry. Set up the basic stack, jump to the entry point. Um, AP entry. Well, we know this address. This could be the um, this could be the uh, stack. Seven C O O. We're gonna jump to entry. Check this out. Y'all are going to love this. So we have a stack. We know the specific address where that's at. Uh, so what we can do is... Um, Uh, okay, so we're going to swap the stack with a zero, compare AX with zero, uh, wait for stack, uh, we can do a test, AX, AX, uh, jump zero, wait for stack, so this should bring up that first, uh, the first core, maybe. What's what's this doing? Is it triple faulting? No, it's not. Is it just printing so fast? Yeah, yeah, it is working. Okay, sweet. Um, so the other cores aren't coming up yet, because the other cores can't do shit. So ASDF. That's printed in the bootloader. The other cores can't come up because we took the stack away, right? We we swapped out the stack with a zero, and that basically means that no one has access to a stack because uh, we swapped it in with a zero atomically, and then we're waiting until it gets filled back in. And then what we can do here uh, in source uh, assembly routines shared. Uh, bootloader, source, assembly routines. Uh, then here, at the very end, um, we're done with our stack. Uh, give access back to anyone waiting for a stack. Okay, we're going to move into OX7COO, uh, 7E00. We're going to move a word into here, which is 7C00. There you go. Oh, we are, uh, we are still using this stack? Yeah, we're not done with it until we get into the kernel, technically. Well, that's fine. Did I get rid of that comment? Okay. So then at the kernel, by the time we get here, we'll have a new stack. Uh, here. Core, pointer, right, volatile, ox 7 e 0 as mute u16, and we'll write in a ox7c00.
Okay. Uh, so the other core did come up. Uh, and we're going to do, we're probably going to want to clear this log. It'd be really useful. But anyways, the other core came up, and then that failed. 72.17. Oh, we, we don't want these to, uh, since they're making new kernels, they're all going to keep sippy sippying each other. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and we have we have no way to uh, protect against that because we don't know which one's the BSP. <laughs> but they did all boot. They did all boot. Um, covered <laughs> without seeing my message. Oh fuck! What was it? Am I right in thinking if you jump to the entry point, you'll need to detect the core ID uh, to verify to not set up the cores again? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the little things. Now I could get the, I could probably get the BSP flag. Um, I think I have that in Sushi Roll. Uh, shared CPU source is BSP. Yeah. So this is going to detect if the current CPU is the BSP. Uh, so we'll open up shared CPU source. Returns true if the current CPU is the bootstrap processor. Otherwise, returns false. This is an inline. And uh, we'll probably make some constants in a second. Okay. If do 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 here. If CPU is BSP. Ah, read MSR, not found in the scope. Oh, yeah, we don't have read MSR. Uh, read an MSR. RD MSR. Turn a U64. Let val low is U32. Let val high U32. Asm. Uh, read MSR, EDX will go into, will be written to val high, EAX will be written to val low, ECX will be the MSR, we'll give this a memory clobber, and Intel, and volatile. I've been doing volatile Intel, so we'll be consistent. Okay, and then here we'll do uh, val high as U64 shift 32 or val low as U64. We're going to need to put some parens around this, and then this I don't think we need parens. Uh, memory colon. Uh, outputs EDX high, EAX low, ECX is the MSR inputs, memory clobber, volatile, and Intel. Okay, so this might work now. I don't know if that just went that fast. Ah. Uh. There's also a chance that we wrote over the BSP bit. So we might have actually lost that information when we did the write. Well, 
we're not at that point yet, but I'm curious if writing over that, I wonder if that bit is persistent. If there's, if we can overwrite that bit or if it's around forever. Okay, um, what we're gonna do in the bootloader, we're gonna say, um, if serial is none, the boot args are constant, so we can actually say uh, serial port, and then for this in zero dot dot a hundred print clear the screen. Doop. What's going on? Is this uh, triple faulting? Is it just not working? Uh, force off, boot. Uh. I guess we'll just change the message, like print new. I just don't know if it's scrolling that fast. Maybe this is broken. I don't think we broke everything because I should be able to, we'd at least get the print. I think this output is broken. Why do I feel like everything, every tool that I'm using is trying to get in my way? I don't like it. I don't know how you reset this. Uh, let's see, hopefully that'll do it. Uh, we'll, we'll force that off and then we'll reopen this. Apparently it still remembers it. Okay. Force off. Close vert manager. Reopen vert manager. It takes a long time for vert manager to open, so we're waiting for this for a minute. Oh, maybe this died. Sometimes this PyPixie server, I think, stops serving things up. But usually it does it through a, a backtrace, so I don't think it did die. Russ, give any interesting guarantees or advantages when programming at this low of a level? Uh, oh. I see. Um... Let's see if that comes back up. Maybe the uh, maybe the recursive sippies made. Yeah. So that says okay. Unless that's getting stuck. I'm just going to set up I'm just going to set up the stack. Maybe something's getting fucked there. I don't know why. Oops. Mm.
Um. Okay, sudo. Let's check out that port. Dev PTS two. Ah, uh, okay. So the serial port is like gone. Okay. Oh, yeah, uh, cat. Yeah, never mind. Never mind. Dude, what the fuck? Oh, that's deadlocking. Oh my god, I'm a fucking idiot. Ugh. Guys, you gotta let me know when I'm doing dumb shit. We had the lock. Uh, but we, we can do this. Uh, standard mem drop. That way we don't have to do the if check. Guys. Set of a basic stack. Honestly, uh, move SPX. Huh, <sighs> that was not that hard, was it, guys? New. <sighs> Goofballs. Okay, here we go. Sent an ips in it sippy sippy. Uh, actually, here we can just say ox7c00, and this is just going to be a um, stack avail. We'll just do that. Stack available is 1. Stack available, byte, al, 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 al. Lock exchange, AOL that. If it's zero, then then get it, and we can put a pause in here too. Look at that. Now we're being friendly. Okay. Four CPUs. Okay, sent and it sippy sippy. Jump entry. And now up here, uh, we need to fix that in the kernel. 70E00, we just need to write a one to mark that the stack is available for use again. Okay, why are those cores not coming up? Do we got lock problems? That should release all the locks. Didn't we have this working, kind of? Dude, it boots so fast, you can't even tell. Oh, I hit pause. Hey. Oh, uh, we can't. 
necessarily do that jump. Now we can. That'll normalize the uh, segment. That'll jump to entry. Okay, that might have been our problem. Let's take a look. Yep, that was it. Beautiful. Look at that. We're we're booting four kernels. <laughs> And yeah, the knit sippy sippy is only for the first one. Now, I do want to see if that BSP bit is valid even after we do this. Uh, I'm gonna assert CPU is BSP. Because that's gonna check the 1B that we just wrote. I just wanna see what happens here. Oh! Uh huh, it's not. So it's no longer the BSP. So in that case, we actually want to use the... Hmm. Yeah, that's actually kind of interesting. Um... God, I can't believe I have to preserve that bit myself. Well, I can do this. Or CPU is BSP. As a U32 shift... I think it's bit eight. Pretty sure it's bit eight. If we're wrong with our guess, we'll just do it again in a second. Uh, or, oh, it's U64. Wow, we are so smart. Okay, so that'll normalize the APIC to be at the right base. And there we go. Yeah, we boot four different kernels that fast. You like that shit? Four separate kernels. Four different address spaces. 4x the data. 4x the bits. <laughs> That's fucking awesome. It's literally just mapping the kernel to four fucking places. Woo! Oh, you know we gotta, you know we gotta, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, know we gotta boot 12 of these bad boys. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, we gotta have this display up. Oh, 12 kernels. <laughs> Everybody gets their own kernel and address space. Woo! <clears throat> <laughs> Actually, a relatively interesting model to be able to support for CPU research uh, because you can kind of have four different isolated things running on the system that you can try and attack. Uh, probably would just want to use VMs for those, but yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight... 9, 10, 11, 12. There's all, there's all the kernels. How do they share I.O.? Yeah, I mean, in, in this case, they're, they're using locks. This is so fucking awesome, man. And this is, uh, um... Uh, let's see. SP bootloader source stage. Oh, we have stage zero here. This is uh, wait for these uh, shared uh, early boot stack to be available for use. Okay, pause. XOR that. Uh, if it's zero, wait for stack. Set up a basic stack. Blah, blah, blah. Um, 
do not move this. It must stay at OX7 E O O. We release uh, the early boot stack once uh, once we get into the kernel and are using a new stack. Uh, we write directly to this location. Okay. Um, so this is going to be, uh, we'll say it release stack, uh, release early stack. Initialize the core locals, release early stack. We'll just say fn release early stack. And this is going to be uh, release the early boot stack such that other cores can use it um, by marking it as available. Um, technically, we should do a. We'll do one of these bad boys instead. Uh, even though on x86, uh, rights are atomic, but we can say um, uh, OX7E00 as const atomic U8. dot store one ordering sequentially consistent and this is uh, use core sync atomic atomic u8 and ordering Yeah, and we just need to deref that. Okay. Should have the same effect. Yep, it does. Uh, okay. Uh, release the early boot stack now that we have our own stack. As const atomic right. <laughs> Go fuzz the universe now. Oh, we're not there yet. We still need to. Uh, we need to set up. We need to set up uh, virtual memory and let's actually have these. Let's uh, have these share the kernel. Thoughts? Thoughts on sharing the kernel? Anyone strongly opposed to sharing the kernel? Um, this is going to be the, um, stack vatter. This is going to be the virtual address of the next stack. Atomic U size, new, ah, atomic U64, new. Okay, uh, use core, sync, atomic, atomic U64, at uh, ordering. We're gonna start, this is where the stacks will be allocated. Uh, we'll say, um, uh, I need a good address. I need a good address. The 8008, the 6969. We're getting all the good suggestions. Uh, um, const kernel stack size u64 uh, uh, size to allocate for kernel stacks 8085 you know you realize we can do boob if that's what you're going for chat <laughs> that 
We are capable of using bees in hexadecimal. <laughs> that is a valid address. Um. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> um. Uh, actually, uh, this gets me thinking that there's a bug I need to fix in uh, my page table stuff. Uh, shared page table source this. We're gonna canonicalize an address. We'll do that through CPU. So we're gonna do um, canonicalize an address. Uh, this is going to be inline fn canonicalize address adder u64 u64 and actually this is going to be i64 well it's going to be a u64 yeah 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 so we're going to do address as i64 shift to the shift to the left by 12 and then we're going to shift it to the right by 12 and then recast it to U64. So that's gonna canonicalize the address. That's gonna sign extend it across a 52-bit boundary. Right? Yes, yes it will. Um, wait, we want a 48-bit boundary. 16. Anonymous cheer. Thank you for all the biddies. Oh, those are some spooky ghosts, too. Hell yeah. Huge cheers. Huge cheers. Hot damn. Thank you very much. Okay. Canonicalize an address. This is going to uh, sign extend it. So. Uh, you've seen, uh, if you've ever looked in the debugger on a 64-bit system, you've seen that, well, if you've only done userland debugging, you probably don't know that. But, uh, if you've done any kernel development, you'll realize that x86 addresses must always start with those bits or, well, the 8 being a 0-bit. And the reason for that is on Intel, the address space is actually only 48 bits. And that's, uh, you can compute that through the page tables, which we implemented earlier. We had four levels of nine bits each and then 12 bits of paging. What does that turn into? Well, that is four times nine. It should be uh, 48 uh, plus 12. Yep, that's 48 bits. And that means that the you can't actually have a full 64-bit address. So what do you do with the bits that you can't use? Well, Intel actually requires that they are sign extended of the 48th bit. Uh, and that means that if you were to make an address, for example, um, so this is, uh, if we were to go with the addresses, and you've probably seen the 7FFF before, this is the... In terms of Intel land, these are contiguous addresses. This is the next address that follows this address. Isn't that cool? And that's basically because when you add one to this, it becomes this. And then that is the 48th bit, which is set. And thus, that has to get sign extended to here. If you access an address where these four or these 16 bits are not the sign extension of the 48th bit, you will get a general protection fault, which is an exception, and it's a very catastrophic exception. Similarly, page faults are used when you have a paging violation, when you access memory that's not mapped. However, you'll get a general protection fault if it's a non-canonical address, which is really interesting because on a page fault, the CR2 is set up with the faulting address. But general protection faults, uh, you don't get this. So this is why on Linux, if you get a general protection fault, uh, you access a non-canonical thing, sometimes your debugger is going to struggle to tell you what address uh, failed to be accessed. Um, and basically, on a general protection fault, if you want to figure out the address that caused the fault, you have to disassemble at the faulting 
RIP and decode the instruction uh, and decode the um, address operand. And fuck you if there are two addresses being accessed in that instruction. <laughs> you would have to then check all the different memory operands and then figure out which one is non-canonical. <laughs> it's just a clusterfuck. It's a complete clusterfuck. If you do DRF of that, it'll crash. Yes, you cannot map that. It's impossible to map it. It'll crash unconditionally. But yeah, so we're going to canonicalize an address. And the reason we want to do this is we want the ability when we map in our page table code, fn map, which will take a vatter, and this will take a vatter, and then we'll get to here. And here's where we do the raw mapping operation. And here what we're going to do is if the virtual address is not aligned to the page size, then we're going to get upset. Or if the CPU which I think I have, yeah, uh, CPU canon equalize address. Uh, did I call it address? Yeah, I did. Canon equalize address of vatter.0 is not equal to vatter.0. Make sure that it's aligned to the page size and canonical. So we're going to canonicalize the address, and if it's not equal to the address, which means it has changed when we canonicalized it, it's no longer valid. And we have to mark that as pub. OK. And now we'll have this complaint, and it'll be like, whoa, 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 whoa. You cannot map this if we try a non-canonical mapping. How do you like that? That's some fancy stuff we got going on here. All right, so now uh, we're in the bootloader again. We have the stack. Now I need an address. The whole time, the whole time I was fucking off doing this canonical fix, you guys were supposed to be telling me where I should put my stacks. B stack? Ooh, that's gross, man. That is disgusting. But I like it. I like how disgusting it is. Is that is that little ending or big Indian? It looks like Yeah, so I need to flip it. So it's in reverse, yeah. Oh my god, yeah, if I do a memory dump, it'll literally show up as stack, 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 stack. Oh my god, that's so fucking funny. If you look, if you look at a stack, all the stack pointers will say stack. <laughs> oh my god, dude, that's so good. I'll never run this in a debugger, but... Uh... That is pretty fucking good. We might have to do STK. Um, <laughs> so, so Napalm, we got recommended thanks to uh, uh, Desu. He says that the address that we should use for our stack should be <laughs> this, which is the little Indian byte pattern for stack such that if we were to look at the ASCII representation of memory, any stack pointers will say stack. <laughs> Dude, that's brilliant. Uh, oh yeah, we don't have many, uh, we don't have many bytes left. So we can't, we can't do stack. We might have to do STK because we're going to allocate, uh, we're probably going to end up allocating like one meg stacks uh, for up to uh, 280 processors. So we might have, we might have, let's say, let's say 512 megs of stack. Um... 
if we have 500 total makes of stacks, then how many bits is that? That. So those will all be randomized. These, the bottom one, two, uh, basically I, I kind of want the bottom four bytes to be unused because it will end up adding this to it. Yeah, that's kind of frustrating. There just aren't enough bits in the address space. It basically gives you two, two bytes. <laughs> We're in 64-bit mode, Naple. We've got full 48 bits now. Yeah, four four hex values, yeah. Ah, that's frustrating. Um I mean we can, we we can put it here. Uh, STA, uh, is this STAK? No. This is S, STCK. Yeah, this is STCK. Um, so we'll have the, yeah. ST it is. Yeah, I think so. And that's just 7473. If it's STK, then at the upper end, well, due to the endianness, is that how that works? I don't think so. Because it's the S that will change. Unfortunately, in this in this circumstance, so we'll just do st, and given we don't have more than four gigs of stack, uh, they'll have st in the the name, and it's a nice number. Okay, so this is the stack virtual address, and this is the damn. This song is good. Um, boot args. So this will be pub stack vatter atomic u64 uh, the virtual address virt virtual address of the next available stack uh, this is just used to uh, give unique stack addresses to each core as they come online. Uh, this doesn't need to be honored unless... Um, doesn't need to be honored if you have another method of creating uh, unique non-overlapping stacks for cores. Right. That's what it's going to be used for, but uh, I'm just mentioning that because it's like, this isn't a hard requirement. This is just uh, a way that we can manage this. Use core sync atomic, atomic U64. Okay, and then here, uh, I'll be right back. I'm going to refill my water.
All right, what are we doing? Uh, yeah, we got a. Uh, we're gonna put the page table in here too. And if we do that, if we put the page table in there, we can do a pretty incredible thing. We already have page table open. Check this out. Bye. Oops, that was the wrong one. That was the wrong one. This, from CR3. I don't think we'll ever actually have to create a page table from an existing one because we can use the same page table uh, structure in 64 and 32-bit land. I think a GM is uh, uh, fucking with my rat. Oh yeah, <laughs> a GM is literally here. <laughs> Glad you're checking in. <laughs> and like my new house. <laughs> I don't know if you left. Been here a couple times. Nice. Uh, check out my loot, uh, my, my webs. <laughs> Just need one more item. Just the sword. Yeah, got the bear today. Yeah, this is like. Uh, it's so OP. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I knew it. See you the second. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fuck. Oh, wow. That'd be OP. I'd be training up there. <laughs> I did try it. <laughs> That's what happens. Uh, I think technically uh, rots and tarantulas can be lured here. Wow, I spelt that wrong. Three rots might be able to kill me. Might. I don't care if rots can go through armor. Shield is just RNG though. Alright, bear back. <laughs> Gonna go AFK again. Uh, streaming some code. Um. Uh, bot enable mint procedure. Procedure. Ah, fuck! I spelt it wrong. <laughs> I, I, I like to, I like to fuck with the GMs. <laughs> yeah, a guy, uh, Spectre is really chill. So, amazing, free blueberries for all visitors. Slightly manic from loss of sleep. No, 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 no,
<clears throat> what were we doing? Uh, we we deleted this. And yeah, maybe I should sleep soon. Unfortunately, I didn't hit the record button, so I'm gonna have to download this VOD from Twitch. Which will take a while for it to be available, but yeah, I didn't hit record today. Like a fucking idiot. I blame that on someone who I was on a call with who distracted me from kind of having my standard procedure when I start up my stream. So, I think that's why, but it's available immediately. Yeah, but I, like when you click the download button, it takes, it like processes a bit. It, like, it might literally be 30 minutes. Uh, but, which means I'll have to download it tonight. And then tomorrow I can upload it because I'm going to sleep. Uh, so this VOD will be delayed probably one night, which sucks. Read, read the description and the link to the VOD on Twitch. <laughs> okay, page table. Lock cell. New. None. That's going to have the page table. Who would have thunk? Use page table. This means that we can... Oh my god, we broke the trend! We broke the trend! Rip. Time to, time to call it page... P... Page table. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, uh... Repper C, Atomic U64, that's Repper C. Um, page table, we need to make that Repper C. Anything that we put in here, uh, structures to pass between um, both the 32-bit and 64-bit uh, modes. This structure must be identical in both modes. Uh, thus, no using pointers, references, or U sizes. Also, make sure everything is is marked uh, repper C. Otherwise, the 32 and 64 bit variants may slightly be reordered uh, to, as Rust by default allows reordering of non repper C structures to make, uh, to fit alignment demands without padding. Bet you didn't know that one. <laughs> That one's gotten me a couple fucking times. <laughs> uh, pub struct. I guess that's relatively common knowledge. But you can kind of get away with it a lot, and I think a lot of people do. I don't know if repper seeing the top level makes all of the subs repper see. I don't think so. That would make no sense. And I don't think there's a way to force repper see, unfortunately. Oh, and I wasn't attacking myself in Tibia. Okay. Uh. Page table lock cell option page table. Uh, the page table used for the kernel. Vim shared boot args source. Oops, cargo. Toml and we'll do uh, page table path is dot dot slash page table. Cargo run. One argument. Oh. Fuck.
we give it that lifetime temporarily. We could actually arc. We could... We could arc it. The problem is this needs to have a reference to the uh, free memory. More specifically, a type that implements FizzMem. And the FizzMem types are actually going to be different for kernel and... Fuck. Yeah, this is actually really weird. Um, yeah. Damn it. Uh, you guys are going to hate me for this. The problem is that free memory and page table reference each other, kind of. Uh, the problem is that page table is going to have a different implementation of FizzMem uh, in the kernel and in this. Uh, so I think this is actually going to be the solution. We're going to pass fizzmem to all these functions. Seems fine. Yeah, I agree. Unconstrained type parameter. Yeah. Can we do that there or do we have to put it here? And I don't, we don't need the A anymore. I don't think. Oh, I think we will need it. Make generic function. Remove the generic from impl, yeah. Okay. So then all of these are gonna need to take that. No need for A? Yeah. Yeah, we don't need it here. Okay, perfect. Um, this doesn't need it. This does. This does. Fizz mem. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know the best way I want to write this. Fizzmem is equal to a, a mute p. Oh, we fucked this one up too. Okay, uh huh. Mute self, uh, fizzmem, mute p. What a fucking function, man. And then... This one needs it as well. Uh, fizz mem mute p. Map and it is fooked. Was that before? Yeah, I think we fixed that, right? Oh, this call. 
fizz, man. Okay. Passing the fizz mem. This now takes fizz mem. Anything that uses fizz mem is here. Beautiful. Now we're failing uh, at 146. Fizz mem. Nice. So now we're failing the bootloader uh, map in it. And this is pmem here. Expected one argument. Oh, we do need it for that too, okay. Eat PMM, 108. Oh, fuck yes. And then this will be based on the page table. So this will set up the serial driver. That'll initialize the MMU. This will initialize the page table and the boot args, uh, or, um, Yeah, I want to make another structure in here. So now we'll be able to lock the page table between the two. This is going to be fucking sweet, man. Uh, oh, we didn't rep uh this. I need to do this ASAP as possible. rep C. Done. Uh, fizz adders and vert adders represent those. Okay. So the page table is represent, which has a fizz adder. The fizz adder is represent. And that everything in here has been represent. Now we can pass in, uh, we're going to make another structure in boot args, and this is going to be rep c um, pubstruct kernel, kernel entry. Actually, is it just the entry point? The stack, CR3, the CR3 we know. Yeah, so we can just make another field. Okay, so we'll do pub uh, kernel entry. Ah, uh, this we can do an atomic U64. Eh, we'll do a Loxel option. Um, this is the address of the kernel entry point. Kernel entry lock cell new none. Okay. So here we're gonna say let's um Yeah, let me think about this for a second. I think I need to add another scope here, and then we're probably gonna have some 
reformatting we need to make of this code then. Uh, so this is going to be download the kernel and create the uh, kernel uh, page table. And we'll only do this if kernel entry is not set. So first thing we're going to do is let's I kind of want the ability to like break out of a scope, but I don't have a good way to do that. Um, would wrapping the entire struct in a lock cell instead of individual fields be worse? Uh, yeah, because some of these, I want some of these fields to be able to be used uh, independently. And like some of these, like this stack virtual address, this is free. You can just grab this by reading this, by loading that. And we might end up putting some other information in here that isn't actually updated. Some things in here will be only, well, I guess this is an example of something that's um, not updated, but I don't know. Nothing in this structure is gonna be too performance critical. I think lifetime-wise, it might be better to have these separate, uh, especially for things like serial. We don't have. To, we, I don't want to lock the. I don't want to lock memory to get access to the serial port. If that makes sense. So yeah, it would kind of hurt some of the scoping of of some of the accesses. Okay, kernel entry. Is that what we did? We just added kernel entry. Okay, so here we're gonna let uh, let kernel entry is equal to uh, boot args dot kernel entry dot lock as mute ah. Uh, We're gonna lock that and we're gonna say if kernel entry is none, if it's none, I think we just have to scope this whole thing, sadly. Entry point is that. Ooh, we're actually pretty close on these. It all bytes. It's actually not too bad. Wow, that was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. So if the kernel entry is none, then we download the kernel. We're going to parse that. We're going to create a new page table. Um, and then we're also going to get page table is equal to boot args page table dot lock. Uh, here we're going to assert that the page table is none. Uh, page table set up before kernel? Should never be possible. Just, it literally isn't possible. Uh, but I like having assertions. So we're going to add it. So we're going to download the kernel, parse the PE, add the physical memory, add the identity map, here we're going to map in a stack for every core. So at this point, we're going to set entry point is equal to sum p dot entry point. Uh, set up the entry point and page table. So page table is equal to sum p uh, of oh, page table. I think we can just move it into there. Uh, this isn't ready yet. 119. Entry point. Oh, kernel entry. Hmm. Nice. And then this 
this can just return what we were doing before, which was um, entry point stack and a CR3 equal to this. And then here we can return uh, entry point is going to be kernel entry as ref unwrap. And we're going to use this syntax. Uh, then we're going to do that's the kernel entry point. We're going to get the page table as ref unwrap dot um, table. And then the stack, we'll just give it zero for now because we haven't set that up yet. And actually, we're going to get the page table here. Page table is equal to page table as mute. Uh, at this point, the page table is always set up. We're going to need that to make these um, expected that found a lock cell guard on page table. Oh, we shadowed it, didn't we? No, we didn't. Uh, page table is equal to page table. What am I doing? Uh, this is table. Zero, comma. And then this we can just say uh, page table dot table. Expected use 32, found a fizz adder. Done. Cannot borrow as mutable. Oh, these are all easy. These are the easiest Rust errors I've ever had. Holy shit. Okay, now we need to make a stack. Uh, <laughs> let stack adder is equal to uh, get a unique stack address for this core. We'll do this from uh, core or boot args stack vatter. Fetch add uh, kernel stack size. And then this is going to be um, kernel stack pad. And this is going to be um, padding dead space to add between kernel stacks. Uh, and we'll set this to a meg. And that's just dead space that's going to be between the stacks, so we don't end up having stacks right next to each other, just in case we have some weird corruptions or overruns or something. We don't want them to overflow into another stack. It'll obviously be a deterministic amount of weight, but it's pretty hard to do a out of bounds on the stack um, in Rust. Honestly, one meg's a bit egregious. We'll do 4K. We'll just put one page between them. That'll just, uh, actually we'll put like 32K between them. Uh, kernel stack pad, fetch add. Kernel stack size plus kernel stack pad. Ordering sequentially consistent. Okay. So now we're going to map in the stack. That's going to use pmem at this virtual address. It's 4K paging. The size is going to be uh, kernel stack size. Kernel stack pad is dead space. Uh, it's RW, non-executable. Oops. Oh, colon. Uh, table not found in the scope. Yep, this is a uh, page table at this stage. And then pmem. P 
redeem them, we can do here. Get exclusive access to physical memory. In fact, we can do that here. We're going to need it regardless. No reason to acquire it twice. And then here, bye. Holy shit. Okay, now this is uh, stack adder plus kernel stack size because we want it to be the end of the stack. Um, yeah, this should boot and work now. Holy fuck, is this gonna work on all cores now? Kernel entry in a page table. If the kernel entry has not been set, then we're going to, uh, if no kernel entry is set yet, download the kernel and load it. So for all the cores coming through, they're gonna grab this lock. If it's none, they're gonna set up the serial port. It'll clear the screen. Here it's gonna initialize the MMU, which will be done once. Here, we're gonna get access to the kernel entry routine. If the kernel entry routine is none, this PMEM has been initialized. Um, if the kernel entry is none, then we have to download the kernel. We download the kernel, we set up the page table. Uh, we then move the kernel entry point and the page table into, uh, into the globals under the locks. And then here, we get access to the page table and the stack address. We map in the stack for this specific core. We have a unique stack now for this core. And then we return the page table and we jump into the kernel based on those arguments. Yeah, I think we're ready. Okay, I don't know if we're triple faulting. Doesn't look like it. Are we just not printing anything? No. No. We're deadlocking something. Um, oh, I think it's the, the PMEM lock. I cannot have that. Uh, while I'm downloading the PE. Not a problem. There we go. Uh, I think that's everyone. Unless we're triple faulting right now. Then all cores should be online with this Let's try it. Print core ID this online. Core ID. That's all the cores right there, baby. Whew. Fucking easy, man. Fucking easy. Easy clap. Not requesting multiple kernels anymore? Yep, we check if we have it, and then we uh, use one kernel. And so these are kind of all fucked up, right? Um, I'm gonna get rid of this print. This code is gonna all get changed. This is shit code. Just a heads up, this is shit code. That will get changed. This is unacceptable. Uh, also, what's unacceptable is this up here. We have uh, two hard-coded uh, CRs. So, um, const, uh, we need to make constants for those. Unacceptable. Oh, I've got a bird flying into my window. <laughs> um, 1B, what is the name of that? 
So let's see, uh, uh, 1BH is probably how they're going to mention it here. IA32 APIC base. MSR for uh, APIC base. IA32 APIC base. Dude, I have no idea. I feel like this one bird every morning flies into my window for the past week. I've tried closing the shades and it still fucking flies into it. I have no idea. Does Rust have pound defines like C? It has macros and it has uh, constants. So both versions, yes. Um. We've got another magic constant here. Uh, uh, O101H. Fuck yeah. Const this. U32 is OXC001. Uh, MSR for GS base, for the active GS base. I, I, a 32 GS base. Okay. So this has been cleaned up quite a bit. So I might make a print lock. Um, God, that boot time, man. <laughs> and it's booted. <laughs> so I don't even know if you can see the flicker on the stream, <laughs> but it's, so it's pretty pretty much fucking instant. Print lock is going to be a necessity. Yeah, so we have a lock on the serial port, but Rust, the way Rust does print is it actually issues multiple print uh, calls, and that's causing these to get interleaved. Um, so what I'll do is basically I'm going to make print atomic, and that means anytime you call print, the entirety of the print is atomic. It might get interleaved if you do two prints, but the print itself will be atomic. Uh, print lock. Lock cell new. That fucking bird, man. Uh, pub print lock. Lock cell. Uh, a, uh, a lock to be used to make uh, print macros uh, fully atomic. And I'm trying to think if that's going to be an issue. That could potentially deadlock us. Maybe? No, I don't think so. Uh, we'll do it on the print macro itself and refine. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so we're not using it. We'll go into uh, kernel search print.rs, and then literally in the print macro, we'll do let lock is equal to uh, create boot args print lock lock. Is it not? Oh, this is kernel. So this is going to be a uh, core boot args print lock lock. Oh, not. Yep. Ha oh, ha. Done on the kernel side of things. Bootloader source print. Let lock is equal to create boot args lock. Um, oh, uh, print lock. Done. Oh. I think that's going to do it. Fixed. 
I didn't have a scope in the um the first the first one creates the like print macro. The second one is a, a literal scope that will get generated in that place. And basically the scope of the print was uh of the print lock was lasting the lifetime of wherever you put the macro. Yeah. And there we go. Cores online. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Easy. Easy. I think I'm gonna call it there. Sums up. Uh, get status. Get commit. Holy shit. Uh, what did we do here? Wow, we did like everything, didn't we, during this phase? Wow. Wow. Get commit am added. Uh, uh, bootloader and kernel. Um, I don't know. Uh, this is like added multi-core support, uh, shared page tables, and uh, physical memory between bootloader and kernel. Uh, git push. So that's up there. We have no no warnings, no errors, and we'll reboot it, make sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. So that maps the kernel, we have the entry point, and then all the cores will come on. And since we're using the page table and physical memory locks shared between the core, uh, between the kernel and the bootloader, the bootloader cores will just come online and they'll wait for their turn to get access to the page table and a physical memory such that they can allocate a stack that's unique to the core. And we're, uh, most of my kernels, I had a fixed like maximum number of cores because I pre-allocated the stacks for those and I over-allocated if I didn't have the cores because in the bootloader, we don't know how many cores we have yet. We can do the ACPI walks and everything there, but we want to do that anyways on the other side um, in the kernel space. We don't want to do ACPI awareness in the bootloader. Um, so this allows the bootloader to just be completely blind to whatever's passing through it. Things can just fly into this bootloader, and it doesn't fucking matter where they came from. The bootloader will give it a stack and pass it along to the kernel. And all the AP, and I love this code. I love this code so much because I've never had this before. The AP entry just jumps to the entry point. The BSP is treated no different than the AP. They're just fucking cores. They're just cores. And they just come up and they boot and execute shit. Um, is BSP, we can actually reduce this restriction now. Uh, is BSP... Here we can technically just do it for core ID zero. Uh, we'll keep it as BSP, but we technically can do that. Anyways, Cargron, uh, git commit am removed useless comments, uh, removed dead comments, git push. <sighs> Cargron clean. Okay. So yeah, now we need to add a virtual memory allocator, and uh, that's about it. So we'll make alloc. So in the bootloader, our allocator actually goes directly off of the um, uh, git status as well. So we included the mm file, which is currently unlinked and dead, but that's fine. We'll update it uh, soon. And... So we're going to use a virtual memory allocator in the kernel rather than a physical memory allocator. That allows us to have arbitrary fragmentation and we're always fine. Like we might pad things out to 4K, but it is impossible that we ever end up fragmenting memory to the point we cannot use it. So physical memory is really only used, it's used to create, uh, it's used in the bootloader to allocate the PE, which then gets freed. But then from that point on, everything that's allocated in the bootloader is actually a one-time allocation. And it will keep that allocation around forever because that's setting up the stacks and the kernel uh, PE memory itself. And none of that will ever get freed. Um, yeah. Okay. 
Oh, I'm gonna fix one thing. Um, oh, uh, maybe not. So the identity map is a little bit small right now. Um, we're only, we're only uh, doing four gigs right now, which is tiny. And um, that's going to be an issue very shortly. Uh, we'll actually fix that, uh, tomorrow. It'll be pretty apparent. We won't forget to do that. So, hope you guys had fun. I'm going to go get some sleep. Um. That was a good stream. I think we got a lot done. So feel free to check out the code base. Should be easy to work and should work on real hardware and whatever. We haven't done anything hardware specific. It should just work. So hope you all enjoyed. Hope you all learned a bunch and had fun. Uh, get these two emotes. Let me see. <laughs> easy. Oh, easy clap. Oh, so I have to add a channel, add a channel. Ah, fuck. I don't know how long it takes for that to take effect, but I did add them to channel. Yeah, it might be a refresh. I'll, re I'll refresh my side. There we go. Easy clap. Hey! The easy worked, but the clap has not taken effect yet. <laughs> it's just the easy. I don't know if you guys see that. <laughs> Let's see if it... Uh, I'll refresh one more time. I'm guessing the clap is just right coming afterwards. Easy clap. Ah, it still doesn't work yet. Fuck. I'm sure it'll come in shortly. Oh, I might need to enable it animated. Uh, oh, for my own. I don't even know where that preference is. But you guys can see it, right? Cog in the bottom right. The fuck? Oh, wow. That's fancy shit. Um, oh, show timestamps. Fuck yeah. Oh, mod icons too. That's super nice. Uh, better Twitch TV. Settings. GIF emotes on. Okay, easy clap. Fuck yeah. Works for me. Hell yeah. See you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Play around with the kernel and have some fun. Hope you guys had fun. Make sure you follow me. Uh, I announced this shit on Twitter. So I announced it on Twitter. I don't really announce it anywhere else. So unless you follow me here or follow me on Twitter, you probably won't know I'm streaming. So, enjoy. Thanks everyone for tuning in. See you around next time.